All right, uh, Mayor Wong, we are live. Great. Good evening and welcome to the July 7, 2020 City Council regular video meeting. I'm Mr. Wong. Tonight's virtual City Council meeting is being brought to you using video, video conferencing technology provided by Zoom. We are also broadcasting live on MITV channel 21 and on the city's YouTube channel. City Manager Jesse Bond and some staff members will be participating in tonight's meeting while in the City Council Chambers and maintaining the recommended social distancing. City Attorney Bill Park and some other staff members will be participating in tonight's meeting remotely. Public audience members are listening to the meeting by telephone or using the Zoom teleconferencing application. Welcome all and thank you for joining us tonight. Council members, please uh, have your microphones turned on whenever City Clerk Deb Estrada conducts a roll call during the meeting. The City Clerk will be conducting roll call uh, votes uh, to accurately capture each person's vote. City Clerk, uh, please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Benson Wong. Here. Deputy Mayor Wendy Weicker. Here. Councilmember Lisa Anderl. Here. Councilmember Jake Jacobson. Here. Councilmember Salim Nice. Here. Councilmember Craig Reynolds. Here. Councilmember Dave Rosenbaum. I don't see Councilmember Rosenbaum at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Um, next, we have the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Council to ensure that only the U.S. flag is visible. Please consider turning off your video camera or stepping out of the view of your camera. Uh, please join Council Member Nice in saying the allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We now move to our first item of business, which is to approve the agenda. Before entertaining a motion, I want to state that while Governor Inslee's Proclamation 20-28.6 regarding the Open Public Meetings Act extends the statutory waivers and suspensions through August, August 1, it no longer contains restrictions on what action a governing body may take at a meeting. Council, may I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Been moved by Council Member Nice and seconded by Council Member Reynolds uh, to approve the agenda. City Clerk, please conduct the roll call. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Anderl? Aye. Cal Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Council Member Jacobson? Aye. Council Member Nice? Aye. Council Member Reynolds? Here, or aye. Council Member Rosenbaum? Here. Excuse me, Council Member Rosenbaum, is that an aye for? Aye. For, thank you. Deputy Mayor Weicker? Aye. And Mayor Wong? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes and the agenda is approved. Uh, for this meeting, uh, we continue to use uh, the Zoom platform if a member, uh, council member has a question, council member will use the raise his or her hand feature. I'll do my best to recognize council members in the order that they raise their hands. Uh, after being recognized, he or she will then ask his or her question. Everyone will be asked to limit himself or herself to one question and one clarifying question, if necessary, at a time to give each council member an opportunity to ask a question before a council member is given a second opportunity uh, to ask a question. Next on the agenda, we have the city manager's report and we welcome city manager, Jesse Ball. Good evening, council. Give me just a moment here. Oopsie, wrong order. <clears throat> Where is my, oh, there we go. All right. Is that visible? Yes. Yes. Okay. 
Yes. Again, uh, good evening, Council. It's been a couple of weeks since our last uh, City Council meeting, so I do have a number of updates for you. Let me just modify that. Uh, first of all, a recap on this past weekend and the 4th of July. Uh, Mercer Island uh, Police Department uh, responded to approximately 38 calls for service uh, regarding fireworks complaints from 6 p.m. to midnight on July 4th. Uh, most of the calls were around parks and school properties. As a reminder, uh, our code does not allow uh, fireworks to be discharged from parks and schools, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we had a fair amount of activity at Luther Burbank and the South Mercer Playfields um, slash Islander Middle School area. Um, almost all of the people that officers contacted were not uh, from Mercer Island and they had read online that fireworks are legal here. Uh, this seems to be a consistent problem year after year and that the media uh, in effect promotes uh, that we are not restricting fireworks on 4th of July. Uh, NORCOM, uh, who dispatches for six uh, nearby agencies, uh, also a data point here, they indicated they had over 200 calls uh, in the hour of 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock p.m. on July 4th, and the normal is about 35 calls for that time frame. Uh, we've talked about it a little internally. I think we all anticipated with the cancellation of the regional shows uh, that we'd have more local fireworks activity, and that was uh, the case. Uh, from the fire department, we had no fires or injuries to report, so that is really great news. Uh, we did respond to one uh, trash can on fire, which we assume was caused by fireworks. Uh, fortunately, that was resolved and there was no further damage. Uh, we also, uh, the police went out to Calkins Landing uh, due to a group shooting Roman candles at each other, which uh, is not wise. Uh, fortunately, no one was injured. And we also assisted uh, dog owners with relocating their pets, or not relocating, locating their pets, their dogs. And I don't have any information, but it sounds like we may still have an unaccounted pet or two on the island from July 4th. Uh, COVID-19 update, uh, certainly a number of things to report on. Uh, first of all, our case count is up. I think the last time I was in front of you, uh, towards the end of June, we were somewhere around 70 cases. Uh, I believe this is as of yesterday. We are at 105 confirmed cases. Uh, the average, the daily average is also increasing in King County and it's more than doubled over the past few weeks. So you're hearing a lot of um, information from the governor and King County with concerns about growing case counts, um, not only in our county, but across the state. Uh, locally, most of the increase is among younger people. Um, over half of all new cases are among people that are aged 20 to 39. Uh, you've heard a little bit about this and a recent um, outbreak on the UW campus and involving fraternities and sororities. Uh, and just as a reminder, if you have symptoms or if you were exposed, please get tested immediately. I do know someone personally that was just exposed. Uh, they were able to get tested and confirm negative. So um, keep, keep that going, a reminder to our community. Also, as of today, uh, per the governor, all businesses statewide um, cannot serve customers unless uh, the patrons or customers are wearing a mask. And there are some limited exceptions for uh, medical exemptions. So this was announced last week. This is a big change. Um, I've been out and about um, a little bit this week and I'm noticing uh, greater mass compliance. So this went into effect today. Uh, businesses in the community, if you have questions on this, um, how we can support you, um, even just public awareness materials for your own business and to display in your storefront, uh, we have information available on our Let's Talk site and the link is there. Uh, mass distribution this Friday, our uh, volunteers are keeping up uh, their weekly goal of distributing masks on Mercer Island. Uh, this Friday, July 10th, we have a couple of opportunities for you if you need a mask. Once again at Mercerdale Park from 7 to 10 a.m. Uh, we're also working on a few other park locations and we'll be promoting that as it uh, we get closer to Friday. 
uh, probably across our social media sites and also on our Let's Talk page. In the afternoon, uh, the volunteers will be at the former Tully's parking lot from three to five. Uh, we'll also have a visit from Leap. That's our big green frog, <laughs> our city's mascot. Uh, and representatives from police and fire may be there as well. Uh, today, uh, we had a very, very successful event. Let me fix the screen here for those of you watching on TV. Uh, we distributed 275 PPE kits to Mercer Island businesses. That included 55,000 masks and 1,100 bottles of hand sanitizer. Pretty remarkable effort. Uh, the scheduling was done in 15 minute increments, so we kept people moving and safely spaced out. I have lots of thank yous. So for making this possible, thank you to the Mercer Island Chamber of Commerce, King County, the Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce, One Redmond, Seattle Southside Chamber of Commerce, and Amazon. And uh, Sarah said today, please tell everyone thank you for coordinating this Herculean effort uh, to support our local businesses. So that was a huge success. Uh, also from Sarah Bluvis, our small business liaison, uh, she wanted me to remind all the businesses, the deadline for the Paycheck Protection Program has been extended to August 8th. There's a little over 130 billion left in the program. Uh, that was as of the end of last month. A uh, reminder, this is a fully forgivable loan uh, when used for eligible expenses. Uh, you work with your bank to apply if you haven't done so already. Uh, we know there's been a lot of issues with this program. Uh, Sarah Bluvis, again, our city small business liaison, has learned a lot about the program and she is available uh, to assist you and troubleshoot. So I've got her email and phone number on the screen there. Uh, coming soon, possibly as soon as this week, I believe, uh, some additional seating in the town center. Uh, I know City Council, this has been on our radar for a couple months now. We have uh, particularly restaurants that are able to open, but with limited uh, seating capacity inside. They've said, hey, what can we do to expand out um, outdoors? Initially, we were looking at sidewalks and uh, <laughs> some cities have done street closures. None of those approaches work really well for us. Uh, that doesn't mean we've ruled them out completely, uh, but what we will be doing is mobilizing uh, some picnic tables. We're actually going to redistribute. We have a lot of picnic tables down at Luther Burbank. Uh, we're going to bring some up, put them into Mercedale Park and into the outdoor sculpture gallery just as a start. And then Sarah's going to be, Sarah Bluvis again, will be working with um, actually a community group, I believe a Girl Scouts group on some creative marketing and we'll start promoting the availability of the outdoor seating. Uh, and there may be uh, more to come. I would consider this a phase one approach and we'll take a look at what other opportunities might be available going forward. If you have a restaurant in uh, the town center and you would like to explore some outdoor seating or talk to us about other opportunities, uh, please reach out to Sarah directly. Okay, I do have a handful of city service updates for you. Uh, first of all, we had a water main break on Sunday, July 6, and it was um, in the 3800 block of Greenbrier Lane, which I know you, some of you can't see my, my cursor here, but this is Gallagher Hill Road, and this is Greenbrier Lane. Anyway, the break was pretty extensive. It required excavation and replacement of a whole new section of pipe. Uh, we did have water service back on that evening. Unfortunately, due to the uh, level of damage, uh, the can contamination was a possibility uh, for the residents in that area. We had to issue a precautionary boil water notice uh, for about 14 homes. And uh, that was about a 24 hour notice while we waited for tests. Uh, fortunately, we were able to get notice out to residents um, quickly and uh, the water quality test came back satisfactory. So we were able to lift the boil uh, water advisory. And that picture there on the right is the actual um, pipe that was damaged. So that was a pretty significant uh, break. Okay, uh, moving on. I actually have a pretty comprehensive update on parks and recreation. And I wanna start with park maintenance. Um, first of all, before I say anything, I just wanna give a shout out 
to the park maintenance crew. Um, they are working so hard and they have been working so hard uh, given limited resources. I'm really proud of them. I know the parks aren't looking the way they want them to look, uh, but they're doing their best to keep up with maintenance. So um, I'm hoping none of them are watching the meeting tonight, uh, but I wanted to say thank you. Uh, City Council, as you're aware, uh, we had pretty significant revenue impacts due to COVID-19 and we did make uh, workforce reductions across multiple de departments. Our park maintenance department was impacted. Uh, we laid off our seasonal staff. We hadn't done all the hiring, so we laid off the seasonals that we had hired and we, we didn't hire the remaining seasonals. So typically this time of year, we have 19 staff working at full-time capacity. Right now, we only have eight and that's, <laughs> That's a pretty significant reduction in workforce. Um, so that explains why we're, we're behind. We also don't have any weekend staffing currently. And that's something that we may need to revisit. Um, I'm not sure how to fund it, but it's, our parks are really impacted on the weekends. So uh, what does that mean? Uh, how, how are we prioritizing park maintenance? Uh, COVID-19 related work, there are still restrictions on park use. So our park maintenance crews and management staff are keeping up on signage in the parks and at our park facilities, uh, maintaining closures, and I'll go over that list in just a moment, and performing extra sanitation. This particularly applies to the restrooms. Uh, obviously a top priority is safety related work. So as things come up, um, service requests, if there's a tree issue, if there's a sidewalk or something that needs to be repaired, uh, and vandalism that moves to the top of the list. Uh, we do have a number of safety tasks that we complete on an annual basis. So one of the things we just did was putting in the swim lines at our beaches, which just delineates where the swim areas are. Uh, essential maintenance duties, just keeping up on things like litter and garbage and cleaning pu public restrooms. Uh, the garbage is a little unwieldy, uh, as you've probably observed. Uh, we did just resume field rentals on a very limited basis uh, under the COVID-19 restrictions. So we are doing some work on that. And then trying to keep up with general maintenance tasks. So this is the basics, mowing, uh, repairing, and managing our irrigation systems and brushing trails. What's not happening, uh, and the list is here, is if you've looked at the flower beds, they're out of control, um, so we don't, we don't have capacity to do any of the uh, planter bed weeding or pruning. Uh, we aren't doing natural grass rehabilitation this year or right now. Uh, and any of the project work that was on our list, it's also suspended. So the parks are looking pretty shaggy if you've been out and about, and that's a direct reflection on our current resource levels. Uh, project update from the school district. Uh, along the same themes of park and recreation here. Uh, the school district is in the process of replacing the all weather turf at the South Mercer play fields. This is adjacent to the middle school. It's the soccer field and the track. This work is scheduled to commence July 20th and should be done by the end of August. Uh, this project, the, the turf is at the end of its useful life and uh, we jointly made the call a little over a month ago that the turf either needed to be replaced or the field had to be closed. Uh, so the project's moving forward. The turf is being replaced in a like for like capacity. Uh, Council, I'll just make a little note on that. There is still a future potential project um, uh, renovation of the middle school. Uh, and there's a scenario where, uh, I think I'm getting this mostly right, uh, portables may have to be placed um, somewhere on this field. And so as we contemplated uh, replacing the turf, we wanted to be mindful that um, somewhere down the road, we may have to use this field as a staging area. And at that point you would replace the turf and do, do upgrades at that point. So that's why I note it's a like for like replacement. Uh, we are working with our city groups to get them rescheduled at other fields. Uh, we do have an interlocal covering this work uh, Council, you may recall we have a sinking fund where we've uh, been allocating resources from our uh, field fees that we charge to help support this replacement. 
I'll be coming back to you as early as July 21st, possibly August 4th, uh, to uh, ask you to appropriate the sinking fund money for this project. In the meantime, the school district is moving forward. Uh, the track is not part of our sinking fund or the interlocal agreement, so the school district is funding uh, the track repairs. I think you know all of this, but just to remind you, the community center is closed through August 31st and likely beyond that, uh, we'll be talking more about that over the next month. Uh, our recreation programs are canceled. We're not accepting any program registrations at this time. Athletic fields are open uh, for passive use and for practice only rentals, and that's key. Uh, so we are, we are resuming scheduling uh, participants have to remain in groups of five or less. Uh, they have to follow all the phase two guidelines, which means no games. Uh, and their safety plans are required for leagues to resume operations. So uh, if you are a league or group interesting in holding, interested in holding a practice and you can meet the current restrictions, uh, we have the email address there and the phone number to contact for our um, rental staff. We do have somebody working part-time right now, council, to manage uh, field reservations. Uh, moving on, a reminder, all of our special events and uh, permitted events are canceled. If you're interested in using a picnic area, they're available on a first-come, first-served basis. Again, still no gatherings allowed in parks per the governor's order. Uh, if, okay, I, I have to disclose here, we are having a pretty significant problem uh, we did reopen our tennis courts. Um, as I feared, we are a little ahead of the rest of the region. Uh, we're having a problem particularly with our tennis courts with instructors uh, coming here from out of area and holding uh, classes and providing private instruction and they're, they've taken over our courts. So this is just a reminder, if you are an organized fitness or sports group or club or business, you do need to contact us to get a city uh, permit. Uh, we are doing what we can council to follow up and manage uh, these issues. If you have a, if you're a citizen, you have a concern about something you see happening in our parks, please reach out to us at our call center. And finally, uh, just a reminder, we did have a question come up this week about our special events being canceled. And I just want to confirm that all of our camp, all of our summer special events are canceled. So here's, uh, here's what's open, here's what's closed. Um, our courts are open, our fields are open, the, the boat launch is open. Uh, you can read the rest of the list. Uh, closed, all of our playgrounds. You'll note in the region, all playgrounds are still closed. There's still quite a bit of work happening behind the scenes on how to manage playgrounds. I know this is so frustrating, uh, but just hang in there with us. Um, we're working through it. Uh, we want to make sure you're safe when we do reopen these facilities. Uh, drinking fountains are also closed. I, I don't know, I, I don't anticipate reopening our drinking fountains for a while. We don't have a way to sanitize them. Uh, the community center parking lot is closed, although we have been using it for some events like the uh, PPE distribution today. And we, we also have restrooms still closed at Groveland Clark, the Luther Bank, Burbank Dock area, and Dean's Children's Parks. Okay, uh, if you're a community member wondering what you can do to help since you just heard my tale of woe, considering we have fewer resources, I would say my number one ask continues to be pack it in, pack it out. Uh, I was out in a number of the parks over the weekend. It was a holiday weekend uh, and garbage was just overflowing everywhere. So we are going to be doing um, some additional messaging on this so the community understands what our current service levels are. Uh, and then certainly when you visit a park, please, please stay safe. Um, six foot distance, uh, wear your mask, uh, stay home if you're sick. And we do appreciate your support. This is, this is a hard summer for all of us and uh, we'll get through it by working together. Okay, some, uh, uh, this went out in the uh, Mercer Island Weekly E-News, I believe it was last week, but uh, just to let you know, uh, resources are available over the summer months um, if you are a family in need of, of food or summer meals. So the food pantry is open for island residents on Wednesdays from 10 to 3 o'clock at the community center. Uh, we also have an emergency assistance program. So uh, please contact uh, Cheryl Manriquez and she can offer you some support over the summer. 
Uh, there are summer free meal sites for youth. And again, Cheryl has all of that information and we've also posted it to our Let's Talk website. And um, information on the pandemic emergency school meals program is also on our Let's Talk uh, website. So if you are someone that has a need, uh, please reach out to us. This is exactly what uh, our emergency assistance program is for. I have some good news, City Council. Our new city website is coming soon. Uh, you may recall that the website was nearly complete uh, right as the pandemic was uh, really taking hold and we made the decision to suspend uh, the transition. I particularly didn't want to make a communications change as we were um, communicating uh, about the pandemic. So uh, we've decided that the old website is it's just a problem and we're ready to make the transition. Uh, we're planning for the transition to happen in July. We'll start with um, some beta testing and even ask some of you city council members to look at the new website and uh, give us your feedback before we go live. Uh, so thank you everyone uh, for your patience. We are looking forward to making this transition very soon. Uh, a few other things and then I'll close out. Uh, you, you know that most metro routes, I shouldn't say most, many metro routes are suspended due to the pandemic, including Route 630, which serves Mercer Island. Um, I am pleased to share that over the last five years, the pandemic aside, Route 30 has been very successful. Uh, the community shuttle route, uh, Metro has informed us, will be absorbed into their regular schedule when it resumes. So although we're suspended right now, we anticipate Route uh, 630 will be back um, sometime in 20, 2021. We're not sure yet. Uh, also, Metro has, as you know, some leases at on the island for small park and rides. There are some that weren't drawing many riders, so they're reevaluating that and probably making some changes. Uh, we will keep you posted as we learn more. Also, I should note with Kirsten Taylor's uh, retirement, uh, Ross Freeman is stepping in to help us with uh, metro coordination. Uh, a couple farewells. First of all, uh, thank you to Betsy Zuber. Uh, Betsy announced she is leaving the city. She has um, started her own business and is quite successful. Uh, Betsy's been with us for 20 years and I think many of us know her. We've, we've uh, leaned on her for support regarding uh, senior services and needs and she's just been able to tackle all of it so well. Uh, she's been a core member of our clinical team and just an incredible advocate for our community. Uh, we are continuing to provide senior services, um, including offering referrals until Betsy's position is filled. Uh, you can contact us at uh, the number that's there. Um, again, thank you, Betsy, for two decades of service to the Mercer Island community. We will, um, we will really miss you. Also, uh, uh, and Evan will be joining us for the meeting a little bit later. Uh, Evan Maxim, Max, sorry, Evan. Evan Maxim recently uh, announced his resignation. He has taken a new position with the city of SeaTac. Uh, please uh, join me in congratulating Evan on his um, new position. It will be a loss for us. Uh, as you know, council, we have a number of vacancies uh, due to a variety of circumstances. Uh, the planning director position is one that uh, we do need to fill. We um, opened the job, um, we uh, opened the recruitment last week and I have a fairly aggressive schedule to fill it. I'm hoping to fill it early this fall. And that was a very long report. Thank you for hanging with me. I had a lot to get through. That is all I have. Thank you, Jesse. That was quite an informative uh, report and a lot of information for the community and for the council. So thank you for that. Uh, tonight's agenda will not include in-person public appearances in accordance uh, because of Proclamation 20-28.6 and the governor's extended stay home order. However, individuals wishing to speak live during the appearance portion of our meeting may do so by telephone or by using Zoom teleconferencing application provided, however, they register their desire to speak with the city clerk uh, by 4 p.m. A. Our city clerk will call you by name or telephone number when it is your turn to speak. This is uh, the opportunity for anyone to speak to the city council 
on any item. All remarks are will be addressed to the council as a whole and not to any individual council member or staff member. If any person makes personal, impertinent, or slanderous remarks or become boisterous, threatening, or personally abusive while addressing the council, I may request that the person leave the meeting. When it is your turn to address the council, be sure to speak audibly, state your name for the record, and limit your comment to three minutes. The city clerk will provide a 15 second warning when your time is about to expire. City clerk, is there anyone who has signed up for appearances that wishes to address the council? Thank you, Mayor. We do have four individuals tonight. We have uh, four, four individuals, Ira Appleman, Addie Smith, Al Lippert and Meg Lippert. And tonight we will start with Ira Appleman. I believe he has uh, dialed in through Zoom. Ira? Can you hear me? I think we can, sir. Yes, Ira, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, Ira Appleman, Mercer Island. At the last city council meeting, the council approved without warning a new rushed four month building project to substantially remodel the thrift shop and to pursue a major building project in Mercerdale Park, substantially remodeling the recycling center to accept donations for the thrift shop. I am concerned that while this might be the right thing to do, the community has been blindsided by this rushed project without any public input or involvement, despite assurances to the contrary. At 44 minutes and 21 seconds into the city manager's April 2nd, 2020 COVID-19 online briefing, city manager Bond assured Islanders that the city would not sneak building projects through while the public was distracted by COVID-19 and could not attend meetings. She said, quote, here's what I can tell you Mercer Island community. There won't be any surprises. When the work begins again, we will provide you with ample notice, unquote. You can imagine the surprise of many of us to find out that the city council had covertly approved a major Mercerdale Park building project in the back room that they then voted at the last meeting. The last few months of blatant violations of the Open Public Meetings Act have apparently taught the council majority that the public doesn't matter. For over 23 years, I can testify of my own knowledge that the city has never even suggested that it could approve such a project without substantial public input and involvement. Is it even possible that there's a single council member who doesn't know that for 40 years building proposals in Mercer Island's Village Green, Mercerdale Park, have created great controversy? It's also curious that a city that's been claiming it's on the verge of bankruptcy for the past two years and so easily find $800,000 for this unscheduled project. The city should immediately ex uh, suspend all expenditures and put this project on hold until substantial public input and involvement has occurred. And until the city council has identified protections for the park to make sure this project isn't the first volley in an attack to destroy Mercerdale Park which past city councils have so often tried. End comments. Thank you, Ira. Uh, city Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. Just one moment, please, while I reset my timer. The next person that we have on our list is Addie Smith. I believe she's participating by phone. Hi. There is absolutely no diversity in the council members. There is no diversity in the prosecutor's office. There is no diversity in the staff in City Hall. There, I've only witnessed one black police officer hired last year in August. I believe his name is Officer Robinson. There are no black public defenders. The city of Mercer Island discriminates against defendants who come before the extremely biased municipal court. The prosecutor's office is under contract receiving nearly $7,000 a month, 6,800 to be exact, prosecuting cases, while the public defenders are independent. 
They have no one person or office like the prosecutor's office. Public defenders are paid $300 for disposition of cases without a trial, $400 for disposition of cases by bench trial, and $800 a case for disposition of a case by a jury trial. There is no incentive for public defenders to perform, and they do not. Most often, they try to get people to take pleas, which is utterly ridiculous and extremely biased and completely unfair. These people are likely the target of hate crimes or arrested by racist police on Mercer Island or victims of this of systemic racism by the prosecutors, the court, and the Mercer Island Police. I have reviewed your proclamation on renewed commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I would like to know what changes have you made since this proclamation, or are they just a bunch of words? Where are the black public defenders? And why do you continue to appoint Judge Wayne Stewart? I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Uh, City Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. The next person that we have is Mr. Al Lippert. Mr. Lippert. Okay, we will go to Ms. Meg Lippert and see if she's available. Ms. Meg Lippert. Al, it looks like you're muted. You have to call me. No, sir, um, you actually call into us. We don't call you directly. Is that okay? Can you hear me? Yes. I can. Oh, fine, then I'll, I guess I'll start. Uh, Al Lippert, uh, 4052 94th Avenue, Southeast Mercer Island. I'm going to talk tonight about the Thrift Shop Expansion Project. Apparently, the $800,000 for this project was taken from other projects that were pushed out to some unknown date. If those projects are unnecessary, why are, why are they in the budget at all? Secondly, why do you think that the thrift shop will be making more income following COVID-19? In my opinion, it is not wise to spend almost a million dollars when the payback is extremely uncertain. The conservative approach is to open the thrift shop now and test the waters until the end of 2020. Take advantage of people being home and see how businesses over the summer and fall. Closing the thrift shop now is foregoing months of income and gambling on the future, which by all predictions is uncertain. If this was your personal project, would you spend the money this way? You should not gamble public money on an unknown future while foregoing certain income by opening the thrift shop now and making money that could be spent on covering ongoing thrift shop expenses. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, the final individual on our list is Meg Lippert. Meg Lippert, are you available? I don't. Uh, is Meg nearby? I believe she's available, but neither of us really knew how to communicate this way. Um, so I, I, I don't know what to do at this point because I can't contact Meg. This is Al Lippert talking. Thank you, sir. She had said that she was going to call in and um, she may have had some challenges. Um, if she has something she would like to, um, to share with the council, she's free to email us. That's all I have, Mayor. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 
there being no further appearances, we move on to the consent calendar. Um, consent calendar contains the approval of the counts payable reports for periods ending June 12, 2020, June 19, 2020, June 26, 2020. The approval of the certification of payroll dated June 9, 2020, July 2, 2020. The approval of the minutes of the June 2 regular video meeting and the June 9 special video meeting. And finally, the approval of agenda bill 5715, First Island Fire Department, basic life support core services funding. Does anybody wish to pull off an item from the consent calendar? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the consent, consent calendar? So move. Second. And moved by council member uh, Jacobson and seconded by council member uh, Rosenbaum uh, to approve the consent calendar. City clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council member Jacobson. Aye. Council Member Reynolds? Aye. Deputy Mayor Weicker? Aye. Council Member Anderall? Uh, Council Member Anderall, you're. Aye. Got it. Council Member Neese? Aye. Council Member Rosenbaum? Aye. And Mayor Wong? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion passes and the consent calendar is approved. We now move to the first item of re regular business, agenda bill 5723, repeal of the multifamily housing property tax exemption program. And to uh, start off this discussion, we welcome um, Community Planning and Development Director Evan Maxim. Evan. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. Uh, I believe I have on the screen now a PowerPoint presentation. I can't see you at the moment. Could someone just confirm you can see the PowerPoint, please? We can yeah. see it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so council, of course, uh, agenda bill 5723 is related to the repeal of the current multifamily housing property tax exemption program. Um, what I thought I'd do tonight is provide a, a brief background of the program I've received a number of uh, council member questions, which I've attempted to answer. And then I do have a copy of the motion to put this on consent for July 21st. Uh, the basic idea behind the multifamily property tax exemption program is that qualifying properties, uh, par pardon me, qualifying projects receive a temporary property tax exemption uh, for the residential improvement component of the property. Uh, and I do have an example I'll get to in a moment, which will make this a little bit more clear, but a mixed use building, uh, such as the Hadley, the tax exemption relates to the residential component of that mixed use building. It does not apply to the commercial component or the land uh, underneath the building. Uh, it does not, the, the program does not result in a change to the property tax revenue uh, received by the city during the temporary uh, exemption. Um, those taxes are essentially covered by other property uh, taxes received within the city limits. So there is an adjustment um, if the exemption were used. Uh, and it is, uh, the current program we have is uh, primarily designed to support the creation of affordable housing in and around the town center. So to explain the qualifying projects a bit further, uh, within the town center targeted area, uh, there's an eight year exemption and a 12 year exemption. The specifics for each type of exemption are uh, reflected on the screen here. In general, for an eight year exemption, you're looking at 10% of the rental units to be affordable at 60% of the King County median income. 12 year exemption within town center, it would be 10% of the rental units affordable at 60% and an additional 10% of rental units affordable at 80% of King County median income. Uh, on the next slide, I'll show where the multifamily targeted area is. It is identified on a map in our code, um, but there's a similar set of uh, provisions for creating 5% 
of a multifamily project uh, as affordable at 60% um, in areas close to town center uh, and uh, similarly a 12 year exemption. As a reminder, uh, the King County median income for two people uh, is $86,880 per year. For a four person household, it would be about $108,000 per year. Uh, on the screen, you should see a map uh, reflecting the town center and some of the adjacent uh, multifamily areas. The town center, uh, every property within the town center may participate in the multifamily tax exemption program. And uh, what you'll see here, and I'm gonna attempt to bring up my screen, the cursor on my screen, I hope you can see, there are um, multifamily properties located to the east and the west of the town center that can qualify for the exemption. Uh, this program was established in 2011. Uh, we've had no projects participating in the MFT program since it was originally established. Uh, the program was not updated at the same time uh, as the recent or relatively recent updates to the um, town center code in 2016. Uh, and as I noted in the agenda bill, the comprehensive plan identifies the MFT program as one of a set of regulatory tools available to the city in promoting uh, affordable housing and uh, frankly, multifamily and uh, different housing types. Did receive a number of questions. I thought this is probably best addressed by providing a, uh, an example. Uh, the Hadley building did not participate in the multifamily uh, tax exemption program. But if it did, this would be essentially how that uh, program would benefit the Hadley building and what it would provide to the city of Mercer Island. So the current taxable value of the Hadley building is about $96 million. You can see on the screen how that's broken out between the land and improvement uh, values. The uh, total annual tax for 2020 for the Hadley building will be uh, approximately $760,000. Uh, a portion of that, of course, comes to the city proper, uh, about 11.6% or $88,000 um, in 2020 from that site. Uh, the Hadley building did construct 13 affordable units, affordable at 70% of the King County median income. So again, not qualifying for the MFT project or pardon me, program. Uh, we estimate that the public benefit related to those 13 units uh, is about $109,000. And when I say public benefit, that is the difference between what the market rate, uh, pardon me, the market rental rate for those 13 units would be as compared to the affordability at 70%. So hypothetically, if Hadley had participated in the multifamily tax exemption program, the Hadley uh, owner, the property owner of that site uh, would save approximately $607,000 in 2020, um, which would result in their total uh, property tax being approximately $153,000. The approximate value of the affordable units, so shifting it from what it is today to 60% King County median income, describing this under the eight year uh, provision for MFTE, the uh, approximate value of those units would be $138,000. Uh, dollars in 2020. Received a number of questions uh, from city council members asking about why we've not had uh, participation in the MFT program. The short answer is I don't know uh, for certain why we've not seen participation. I did flag this item as a ARCH work plan item for ARCH to review uh, the MFT program for Mercer Island and evaluate whether or not the financial uh, incentive was set correctly and whether or not it still made sense given our other provisions within the town center uh, development regulations. We have had relatively little town center development uh, since 2011. Uh, so the incentive uh, may just not have had an opportunity to be used. Uh, it also may be an incentive that's more attractive to developers who plan on long-term ownership 
of the building. Uh, so recall that um, when we're creating the affordable unit, uh, that represents both a long-term cost and a long-term benefit for the property tax reduction. It may not be such an attractive program for a, a development company that's looking to build and then sell uh, the mixed-use building. Uh, and then uh, six of the ARCH member cities currently have an MFTE program. I did email the city council a brief, um, or pardon me, two documents summarizing the MFTE programs between the six cities. Uh, those six cities, of course, do include the city of Mercer Island at present. Received a question related to what other incentives uh, does the city have to support creating affordable housing? Uh, at the moment, we do uh, require uh, slash incentivize providing affordable housing on residential construction in town, town center where the construction project would exceed two stories. Uh, to exceed two stories, to go to three stories, 10% of the units must be affordable at 70% King County median income uh, to uh, build to the highest allowed height, either four or five stories, 10% of the units must be affordable at 60% of King County median income. We also have an accessory dwelling unit program. I recognize that not all accessory dwelling units are affordable. Uh, I think there's some nuance there when we're talking about uh, ways homeowners can both offset current homeownership costs and provide for uh, housing for people that are newly entering the, the housing world, uh, uh, younger, younger couples. Uh, and then last, we do have um, the potential to reduce our impact fees related to transportation impact fees, park impact fees, and school impact fees. Uh, so with that, uh, Mayor, City Council, I believe I have touched on all of the questions that I'm aware of at the moment. I do have on the screen the motion that was included in the agenda, though, and I'm happy to answer any other questions that the Council may have. Thank you, Evan. Um, I see that Council Member Jacobson, you have your hand up. Jake, you're on mute. I'd like to, uh, if we could backtrack just a second, ask Jesse a question about her report. Specifically, the question would be, do we have any idea what the cause of the uh, Greenbrier uh, water uh, uh, system failure at this point? Um, I would have to, uh, if Jason's on the line, he may have some more information. I, I don't, Council Member Jacobson. Okay, that's fine. Um, I, I, how about this? I'll be happy to follow up with uh, the council via email. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Weicker. Um, yeah, Evan, can you talk to me a little bit about um, what harm it would be to keep this MFTE on books? It seems to me it's a tool that could be used down the road since we haven't had a lot of development anyway and other cities use it uh, even though we have very limited land capacity and very little potential for more multi-family mixed use development in the town center it seems to me there's no harm in keeping this tool on the books to have the opportunity to incentivize some various forms of housing on Mercer Island. You can or pardon me Deputy Mayor Weicker I'm not aware of a specific harm that I could articulate to you uh, this evening I understood from the city council discussion uh, earlier this year that there was a desire to adjust the policy um, balance between property tax revenues and this MFTE program, which was the basis for my uh, preparing the agenda bill tonight. Any other follow up there, uh, Deputy Mayor? Okay, uh, Council Member Andrew. Thank you. Um, so Evan, I'm not looking at the slide that you showed earlier in terms of the hypothetical on the Hadley, but it, it seems like the Hadley would have saved um, for the developer or the owner over a half a million dollars a year in property taxes had they availed themselves of the MFTE. But yet you say that the property tax revenues would um, would stay whole for the, um, the city and the county. So um, where would the, if, if they say, okay, say, say they saved 
annually in taxes. And, and yet the city and the county do not experience any revenue diminution. Where does that $607,000 um, to keep the, the, the governmental entities whole come from? Uh, thank you, Council Member Andrew. Pardon me. Uh, as I understand it, actually, the property tax uh, payment provided by the remainder of the properties on Mercer Island cover that uh, $607,000. I say that it is an understanding on my part. I have not identified the specific statutory language that provides for that. This is uh, an understanding based on consulting with ARCH staff and understanding how that uh, tax revenue is collected. My presumption is that that adjustment to property owners not participating in the MFTE program, if you will, uh, that adjustment to their tax payment would occur by uh, at the King County Assessor's office. But again, identifying the specific statutory language, I have not uh, located that. Okay, thank you. As a follow-up, I just wanted to be clear, it was my understanding as well, we don't have any evidence to the contrary, that all of the property owners on Mercer Island would make up this differential, essentially providing that $607,000 as a benefit to the developer. That, that is consistent with my understanding, council member. Okay, thank you. Uh, council member Rosenbaum. Sorry, Mary, can you come back? I'm just, I'm reviewing one of the documents that I've been sent over earlier. I'll, I'll, I'll borrow my hand and come back later if I have a question. Okay, uh, Council Member Jacobson, you have uh, your hand up again? You're on mute, Jake. I, uh, I just took it down because okay. was, that was my question to Jesse. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Weicker, your, your hand is up. Right. So, Evan, can, do you happen to remember how many units of workforce housing we have in the town center? I know there are 59 at Ellsworth House, which is the one multifamily property I know that Arch manages completely for us. And it's a handful in the Hadley and the Mercer, right? Like four here, 10 there. Do you happen to recall I, that number? I don't about? recall the exact number off the top of my head. I apologize, Deputy Mayor. I believe you're correct. It's like less than 100, more like 80. I believe it's in that ballpark, but I couldn't, I couldn't confirm without actually reviewing it. Right, one bedroom apartments, two bedroom apartments. Okay. Uh, Council Member Rosenbaum. Yeah, sorry, Evan, the, the documents that you sent earlier today, I know you said that you're not prepared to speak about them, um, but my, the question I have is, do we, do we have a sense, you know, you, you mentioned there's five other cities that have this um, on the books. Are, do you have any ideas to, what the utilization has been in those cities? Uh, Councilmember Rosenbaum, I, there are five other cities within the Arch City Group. So just to be to be careful here, I did not review all of the King County cities. Arch comprises, I believe, fifteen city, fifteen member cities. So, for example, City of Seattle, I believe, has an MFT program. It is not in that material that I provided you. Uh, the participation, I believe one of the documents that I sent you, and I uh, I can't speak to which one at the moment, uh, did include a breakdown of how many units were created. I'm not aware of a specific unit count related to MFT. So units created under which program then? Uh, so the, those summary documents included all of the affordable housing measures provided by those cities and whether or not they had participated in MFTE, uh, but the actual breakdown, whether there was another incentive that created the affordable housing and MFTE was simply one of a set versus the only reason for creating an affordable housing unit. I, I okay. don't, I have that breakdown. Yeah, actually I'm, I'm looking at this again and you did provide MFTE units separately under other land use programs. Ah, good, good. Um, but it does not look, and perhaps for clarity, Mayor, I received those materials relatively late in the day today uh, from Arch, and and really they represent fairly detailed analysis that that I uh, was not prepared to speak to tonight. Can we make sure that that material that uh, distributed to the council uh, is posted or made available to the public so they know that what we're talking about? 
I will work with the city clerk to do so. Okay. Any other uh, follow-up question, Councilmember Rosenbaum? Okay. Councilmember Nice. Uh, Evan, you you said that for the height incentive, there's a affordable housing unit criterion. Can the same units be used against the MFTE? I. As I understand it, Councilmember Nees, provided the unit qualifies for both uh, provisions, so the unit is affordable at 60% uh, King County median income, it would qualify for both the height incentive and the MFTE program. Okay, so in your example, the Hadley, which is a five-story building, I believe, had 10% of the units, it's at 60% to achieve the height incentive? And it's a hundred million dollar building, so each floor is worth twenty million dollars. I, I mean, I guess it's each residential floor is probably worth more than that because the commercial floor would have a different value. Uh, we're saying that the developer of that building could get the additional equity value of maybe a whole additional floor, plus transfer their full property tax burden to the other taxpayers on Mercer Island so that 13 tenants could pay $2,000 a year in rent or $2,000 a month in rent, which is effectively 30% of the that $88,000 annual income that you had as the median uh, King County in, uh, income. And that seems like that's a good enough reason to get rid of the MFTE because the height incentive in the area that we're talking about pretty well covers it. And it's a, it's a double dipping, isn't it? Uh, I think it could certainly be characterized that way. Uh, Council member Nice as a, as a, uh, a unit that qualifies both for MFTE and the height bonus. I would note that the Hadley project, as I understand it, provided affordable units at 70% county median income, not the 60%. I recognize that's a, a, a relatively modest distinction in, in the way you characterized it a moment ago. I, and honestly, this was one of the reasons that I flagged the program for further review by ARCH. Uh, recall that the City Council in amending the Town Center Code in 2016 did provide um, or did modify some of the affordable housing provisions. Uh, they did not update the uh, MFTE program. And uh, I do have some concern that there may have been some unintended consequences related to uh, those changes. So would it not be cheaper for 13 units for the Mercer Island taxpayers to pay the difference in the market rate rent than to subsidize 100% of the taxes for that development? I suspect that's correct, Councilman Renice. Yeah, I do too. Thank you. Before we go to the second round, I have a, a, a uh, and, and that is again on these other incentives that we have. Um, and I, again, I think um, your, one of your slides, Evan, uh, indicated that um, again, if you go above two stories, you, you get certain um, incentives. And so, for instance, on the Xinhua property, which is four stories, is that providing 10% uh, of the units will be affordable? Did I see that right? Uh, Council member, or pardon me, Mayor uh, Wong, the uh, Xinhua project, as I understand it, would include 10% uh, affordable units, yes. Okay, okay, so again, uh, even without the MFTE, um, there are affordable units that are being built on the island. I, I suspect that's a function of the uh, the town center regulations, and again, would be a, a reason to perhaps review uh, this program for repeal. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, 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 delete your screen, or uh, so that we're not. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Pardon me, Mayor. No, 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 that's fine. I'm sorry. Uh, we have uh, Council Member Jacobson with another question. Well, I actually have a motion, uh, Mayor, which would be to set ordinance uh, 20, excuse me. 
can, can we continue with uh, clarifying questions before somebody makes a motion? Okay. Okay. Uh, Council member uh, Rosenbaum. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, Evan, I've got a couple questions that are kind of on the same uh, train here. What is the timeline for the review that you requested from Arch? Uh, on the Arch work plan, I believe this is one of the items that we had in the 2021 Arch work plan. Okay. Seems like we might be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Um, can you, you mention that you, you felt there might were, there's some concern about unintended consequences made in 2016. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? It, and I should clarify, Council Member uh, Rosenbaum, it, it is my concern. I don't know that I've heard anyone else express the concern. It's a concern based on simply the fact that we updated the uh, town center regulations. I believe we modified, and when I say we, I do mean the city council. The city council modified the affordable housing requirements to increase height within town center. Uh, and at the same time did not update the MFTE program. Councilmember Nees a few moments ago made the point that this could result in, in double dipping, if you will, the same affordable unit being used both to increase height and to qualify for a, a property tax reduction. Uh, it is not clear to me at present whether that was intentional by the city council or not. That was the part of the nature of uh, my request to Arch to review the MFT program to ensure that we were not essentially over incentivizing uh, affordable units or creating unin unintended consequences in our regulations. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Weicker, I thought I had your hand up. Was your hand up? Yeah. You know, I guess I'll just ask about the math, right? So we have regulations in our town center code that requires affordable housing after two stories, right? And this multifamily tax exemption is a tool for developers, be they private sector or nonprofit sector, to try to increase the inventory of affordable housing for lower and moderate income individuals like teachers and store managers and newly hired first responders to be able to live and work in their communities. If we didn't have this added tool to go along with our town center regs, which you've already said we kind of need to look at anyway, given that we have so few parcels for multifamily residential mixed use buildings. Um, to me, I don't see an urgency to have to repeal this now while we're dealing with all kinds of budget and COVID implications. So my inclination is to do a little more homework and actually talk to some nonprofit affordable housing developers to find out how this tool is actually used in other jurisdictions, certainly ones larger than ours. It seems to me we don't do any harm by keeping this on the books if it's a tool that could be used to increase a variety of residents who could live on Mercer Island and certainly people of different incomes who could afford to live and work in our community. I'm struggling with the urgency to do this now and I'm not sure Celine's math is clear given that he's not a developer. I know Jake is a developer but I'm not sure he's developed low-income housing. So I feel like this issue could use a little more uh, scrutiny and certainly a little more time. So I, I guess my question isn't really a question, more of a statement around, I'm not sure Celine is right on the math. I'm not sure we'll even use this in our community anyway, given how expensive our land values are, certainly in the town center. Um, so I think I'm inclined to just wait and see how this plays out after getting more data and input from professionals and experts in the field. My interest is in making sure that we have a variety of housing for a variety of income levels and people in our community to live and work here, like a lot of us get the benefit of. Okay. Uh, Council Member Anderall. Thanks, um, Mayor Wong. Yeah, I, I have a kind of a, well, I'm a 180 off of where Council Member Weicker is. I feel like um, waiting is a bad idea. I feel like we have more than enough information even as we sit here today to even waive the council rules of procedure and not set this for consent on July 21st, but to repeal this um, MFTE tonight. Um, I feel like we know for certain that this is a subsidy 
paid for by Mercer Island citizens to developers. I feel like we know for certain that the tool has not been used to create affordable housing for nine years. And I feel like we know for certain that um, new housing is less affordable than old housing. Um, I feel like we also know for certain that um, it's a potential double dip. And so, I mean, it's, if you only need three strikes in baseball, this, this legislation has four strikes in my mind, and um, I would be ready to, to do away with it right now. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask, I don't see anybody else's hands up. Um, well, actually, Councilman Reynolds, go. Uh, you're muted, Greg. Thank you. Um, I, I've been waiting to speak because I thought this was question time, but it appears we've, we've ventured into comment time. So I'll, I'll make a couple of comments. And, and I, I guess I'm in a, a similar position to where Council Member Weicker is. I, I look at affordable housing as being a, a serious problem in the region. It's, it's particularly a serious problem here on the island. And I, I think it's a tragedy that, for example, we don't have a single police officer or firefighter that lives on the island. And, uh, and a very few city employees, period, live on the island, very few teachers live on the island, et cetera. There's just a, a severe shortage of affordable housing. Yeah. Is this the right solution to that problem? I don't know. I suspect there's no single magic bullet solution to the problem, but it's a potential arrow in the quiver for, for addressing the problem. And I, and I, I hate to see a, a potential tool that has apparently worked successfully in other communities uh, uh, be, be taken out of the chest without a lot of thought and a lot of analysis. Um, I'll, I'll confess I didn't entirely follow the, the math analysis that, that uh, Maxim presented. I'd like to look at it a little bit more later and have some time to think about it. But I have a hard time believing it's it's quite the giveaway that Councilmember Meese has made it sound because frankly, if it were, uh, if, if the tax benefit exceeded the rent saving, then developers would be falling all over themselves to take advantage of it. And the, the fact that they haven't suggests that may not be quite as good as, as it appears to be. So I'd, I'd like some more time to, to think and evaluate that. And in particular, the council has looked at, um, has talked about for this year, making it a priority to review some of the town center development regulations. We've got a new uh, moratorium that we just put in place a meeting or two ago, et cetera. And this, I, I think, would appropriately be part of that discussion to consider as part of a town center development rules revamp but taking a piecemeal approach to one part of the town center code without considering the whole project and all the rules more broadly together seems like the wrong way to approach the problem. So I, I, I'm not going to support the repeal. Okay, um, I'm gonna take a quick uh, turn here before uh, I, there are other hands raised here. Um, Evan, you know, I, I guess I was a little puzzled by one of your comments regarding the uh, the fact that, you know, for instance, Mercer Island doesn't lose in the, uh, the amount of the tax revenue, property tax revenue, when there is a project. And the only reason why I have a little bit of confusion is that I did go to, not that this is, you know, the, uh, the all in be all source, but I went to uh, the Puget Sound um, uh, Regional Council and when they were talking about the MFTE. And one of the things that they mentioned is that uh, cities that are considering this program, they have to weigh the temporary loss of tax revenue against the potential attraction of new investments in a targeted area. So that made me think in terms of that there would be a net loss revenue for Mercer Island, but you're saying that that may not be the case. It sounds like if that's not the case, it's a matter of just shifting the tax burden. So Mayor, I'm relaying to you what I've understood consulting with the ARCH housing staff, which would be our, our ex expert team, if you will, on this, which is that it is a shift of the tax burden. The specific mechanics of that, which are usually laid out in statute or in code, uh, I have not located. So I, I am relaying to you the best information I have at the moment. Uh, I can't speak to the PSRC discussion. I, I don't think I was privy to that one. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member uh, Rosenbaum and then Council Member Nice. Thank you. Um, Evan, question for you just on bandwidth here. Um, if this were to move forward tonight, would you have the ability to answer some more of these questions? Should they come back on the 21st? 
it seems like there's some more research to do and, and I would be opposed to sort of move fast tracking this tonight I, when, when I think there's a few a few council members that, that have questions that still uh, haven't been answered. I appreciate that council member Rosenbaum. I will do my best to answer council member questions in advance of July 21st or at that meeting. I, I am, I, as the council knows, uh, also trying to wrap up a number of other projects in the same time period. And so I respectfully, I, I don't know that I'll be able to explore this as fully as the council may desire between July 21st and today. I'll do my best. Okay, thank you. Council member uh, Evan, can you pull up that slide that has the county median income and the Hadley example in it? <clears throat> Bear with me for one moment. Thanks. I believe you should be able to see the Hadley example. The King County median income is located on a different slide, council member. Okay. The, on this slide, the the bolded number 607705 which is the Hadley owner savings you're saying that that tax burden is shifted to the Mercer Island taxpayers that is my understanding council member and, that, and that's the remaining taxpayers that's not any not for profit organizations as deputy mayor weicker mentioned who don't pay taxes this is the uh, remainder of the ratepayers that do pay taxes right is my understanding yes and is the, in that six hundred and seven thousand? is that this uh, also include the state school taxes any county ems taxes any non-city of mercer island taxes as we all know let's call it the other 89 percent of our tax bill those are all in that six hundred and seven thousand. yeah uh that is correct council member niece so just before I get to my next line of questioning, the MFTE is a mechanism that allows a developer to recognize all of their property tax bill savings and shift it to the Mercer Island taxpayers, not just the city of Mercer Island portion. That's right. That is correct. <clears throat> so if the developer is going to save 607,000, the benefit to the Mercer Island residents must be pretty significant because they're also paying 607 thousand for that benefit so if we if we look at the can you go to the median uh, example so the King County median income for 2020 was eighty six thousand eight hundred and eighty so to have an MFTE unit you must be at sixty percent of that number is that right uh, it must be affordable to someone earning 60% of that number. Right, so if we take 86,880 and we take 60% of that, we get to roughly $52,000. And the affordability is the 30% of your annual income cannot exceed that number. So 30% of the 52,000 is roughly $15,500. That would be the affordable rent, annual rent that that person must pay that divided by 12 is around $1,300. So what we have to consider is what would that person pay at market in that place? And I'm just gonna throw it out that I think it's around $2,500. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it's a number and it's something that we can use to continue the math. If they were to pay $2,500, they will now pay around $1,300. Uh, the difference is around $1,200. There's 13 units that have been created. So 13 units times $1,200 uh, is around $15,600 of uh, subsidized rent created per month times 12 months is around $187,000. So I don't care if my math is off a little bit. What we're showing here in my example is that Mercer Island residents, the remaining taxpayers, will pay about $600,000 to offer tenants about $187,000 of rent subsidy. And they will do that for eight years. Uh, that was my point is that it is gonna be far cheaper for Islanders to just pay the Delta in the rent than to give that developer that subsidy because the benefit would be the same. And 
if anybody's having trouble following that math, Evan has laid it out pretty meticulously. Uh, no one has seen this slide deck before tonight, but all of the data is here. Uh, I just don't think this MFTE is is a win-win for anybody on the island. I'm shocked that the tool hasn't been used, but if this tool can transfer all of the taxes, state school taxes, county EMS taxes, sewer taxes, all of those taxes that normally would just be borne by the developer and go to those respective taxing jurisdictions, but now will be paid by Islander residents, uh, to me, that's just wrong. And I'm, I, you know, I'd be ready to repeal it tonight. Okay. Council member Jacobson. I've unmuted myself for once, I think. <laughs> At any rate, uh, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Uh, comment number one is that our company, uh, or my company, however you want to look at it, it's not really my company anymore, but um, uh, we have both built multifamily housing and we have uh, also developed some uh, mostly in a, in a mode where we also do the construction. Um, there are, there's multifamily housing, there's multifamily housing. We just completed a project about two years ago down in Renton where the cost per square foot is about 175 bucks. It's, you know, it's, it's a poor, it's a poor design. It's it, the absolute minimum in terms of materials were put into it because that's what our contract provided. And, uh, suggestions we made for uh, improvements and for safety and other reasons were rejected by the owner. And it, so that, that's that's one thing to bear in mind that, that you know, for the uh, Hadley and the Aljoya, or well, Aljoya's only family of a different character, I guess, but uh, uh, Aegis and some of these are much higher end developments. And in talking to developers about what the market's gonna look like and some other, you know, where we, where, where's all this headed? One of the problems Mercer Island has is that, that the uh, real estate is, is expensive any place in the, in, uh, in the Puget Sound. And so what that means is that, that uh, it, a developer has to be very careful about spending a huge amount of money on the, on the, on the dirt. And one of the things that leads to is some developers is okay. Well, I'll just cut on the construction and develop. I'll, I'll build a cheap building, and and sell it. And that, according to Ray Acres and some other people, uh, is what's going on down in Columbia City. And I know some people that live in those units that ten or fifteen years old and they're dumps. But be that as it may, the I think there's another thing we need to think about as a city council. And that is, as much as I don't like the idea of raising taxes, we may well be in the position of having to do that, whether we like it or not because we, we know that we're on a thin edge. Our uh, uh, financial resources are limited and we're not really well positioned to uh, get a lot of sales tax or do other kinds of things. So we have to be looking at, at how is this city gonna be, uh, how those services gonna be financed uh, four and five years down the line. And I would commend our city manager for, for taking a very hard look at this. Uh, but if we do have to go back to the citizens as we did in 2018, I think one of the things we have to say is we have been very diligent about being sure that, that the income stream to the city isn't uh, uh, diverted in some degree to uh, private developers at what benefit for Mercer Island. Uh, increased uh, costs for utilities and, and for infrastructure and these kinds of things. So I think we need to think about that. And I think that's, as a city council, we need to be uh, on on point on that. So I, I mean, we can study this thing to death, but I think it we can. The city council doesn't do major things like a code rewrite very easily or very well. They're time consuming. They're extremely time consuming for staff, and uh, I think we the ability to to start cleaning things up one by one is in front of us. And so uh, I share uh, my colleagues, uh, and uh, <clears throat> nieces things that let's get on with it. It's time we, we did something and are able to tell the taxpayers, we protected your tax uh, money. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
I have a question, but I'm gonna, uh, Deputy Mayor Weicker, uh, go ahead and ask your question first. Um, it's not so much a question as uh, more of a statement that I don't think this is money going straight into developers' pockets. I think this is a benefit for Mercer Islanders and for the region in trying to increase affordable housing for families and people in lower incomes. And I think developers who try to do anything on this island already know the many hurdles and difficulties they faced given the very expensive land that's here and the expense of building a multifamily mixed use building. If there's any hope of having any affordable units beyond 500 square foot ADUs in our single family residential areas, it's through whatever we can do through our town center codes and tools that the state provides like this multifamily tax exemption. If we're committed to diversity and inclusion and a variety of housing options for all income levels, I think keeping this tool in the toolbox, whether it's used or not, gives us the flexibility to be the inclusive city that we need and have a variety of housing for the people that we need. Market rate, mixed income rate, variety of incomes. This is a tool that hasn't been used yet, probably because we don't have much land available anyway. And as Jake pointed out, it's exorbitantly expensive to do anything in the town center. So if there's any chance of having any affordability at any point beyond us making contributions to ARCH to put it elsewhere, it's through having what little we can do through our town center code and keeping this tool on the books. And I'm struggling with the PSRC definition of where the property tax goes versus Evan's quick assumption. So again, all due respect to Salim and his math and Evan in the slide, I'd like a little more clarity on that um, from some experts down the road. So again, I don't see the urgency. I don't think this is a, a taxpayer giveaway or milking our Mercer Island residents. I think this is trying to do something to be responsible for our island to have some variety of income and job diversity, people living and working in the community together. So I'm gonna not support this repeal. Okay. Again, um, we'll, we'll get a motion on it very shortly, okay? And so, Evan, can I just ask a question? I know, again, there's a few more hands after me, but um, the question I have is obviously the, in drafting this agenda bill, it appears that the staff is recommending the repeal, and if so, why? So, pardon me, Mayor, if I created that uh, that sense on the on in the agenda bill. I actually uh, understood that I was fulfilling the council direction from earlier this year in preparing the agenda bill to describe uh, repeal. The, the staff recommendation. Um, I have not formulated a formal recommendation for you. Uh, you know, this is, I will comment uh, that this is one tool in the toolbox. You have a number of uh, requirements in your town center. And um, I do note that a number of cities have this tool. So I would tend to default, default to something as I described earlier of evaluating the tool using our ARCH uh, staff and coming back with a recommendation to you, which might be to a repeal. Um, I understood I was following up on the uh, previous motion by the city council to prepare this ordinance uh, for your review tonight. Thank you. Uh, council member Anderson. Thank you. Um, well, I just wanted to, to comment additionally. Um, this does seem like a taxpayer giveaway. We, uh, there, there is no evidence to refute that. Um, there is, ample evidence to show that we are already contributing to affordable housing by our contributions to ARCH. And there's also ample evidence that the existing housing multifamily on the island is probably more affordable than what will be built new because new is more expensive than existing. Um, there's also ample evidence that um, the uh, affordable housing incentives created with this have not been used. So I don't know, and, and I see some potential harm if someone is able to vest under this MFTE before we're able to um, stop it and, and cost the city of Mercer Island residents a lot more money in a time when, when we can ill afford to send city funds out the door or even if we're not sending city funds out the door, if we if the city stays whole, we can ill afford to ask our residents for for more money on this. So, 
I just, I don't, I don't get the, the, the love for this tool. Okay. Thank you. Uh, council member, uh, Rosenbaum. Thanks. Um, you know, I, I think we, well, I'm not gonna speak for everyone, but you know, I, I believe that having a more diversity on the Island has become very clear. Um, I think in, especially in the last, you know, month, month and a half, um, I think we've all heard that from a lot of people, um, especially having the opportunity for people who work here in a variety of fields um, to live close. And I think, you know, if you saw the Seattle Times today, housing demand across the region is growing, prices are growing up. Um, you know, I think Mercer Island is going to get further and further away um, from where a lot of people can uh, afford to live and work. Um, and my, my question for you, and I understand there's a significant number of hypotheticals here, but I'm trying to understand the interplay between the height requirements and requirements for affordable housing. Because where I'm coming from is that I wanna get our best bang for the buck here. And I don't agree with this notion, just to a handoff. I think you could say that for any tax incentive, um, you know, if you have a tax incentive for small businesses, is that a giveaway from taxpayers? Um, you know, I, I disagree with that notion, but what I'm trying to understand is what is that sort of interplay between those two things? Because, you know, to, to, you know depending on the math, you know, I think Celine presented a pretty compelling case. Um, you know, I'm not sure we're getting our best bang for the buck here. So could you talk about that? Is there any analysis that you think you could do for us on that? Um, just trying to better understand. Well, thank you, Council Member Rosenbaum. Uh, I think if you zoom out for a moment out of the specific discussion, when we're discussing uh, mixed use or multifamily development on Mercer Island or really in any jurisdiction, uh, there is a combination of uh, financial return that a developer needs from a project in order to finance construction and uh, community desires, public benefits that the, the community is looking for from that project. The MFT program, um, especially as conceived at the state level, is intended to provide an incentive to increase um, some leverage on the part of the community in seeing public benefits in a private development. We're thinking of the financing for, for new mixed use or multifamily construction. It doesn't surprise me that the incentive is somewhat larger than the public benefits dollar value to the, to the public. Because of course, what we're, in do, what we're doing is incentivizing a developer essentially to take a construction risk to build that, that improvement that's desirable to the community. And in that context, an MFT program, along with another, uh, with a set of regulations, may make sense for Mercer Island and its town center. So I, I think you're correct that there is an interplay between the town center regulations, which limit maximum building height to five stories, uh, require a daylight plane, require a plaza, require other public benefits, uh, and also limit the the financial return of construction. There's an interplay between that, the cost of construction, the land cost that was alluded to by Council Member Jacobson and the MFTE program. And, you know, uh, I think the interplay there is a complicated thing to describe. I did not do it justice in the last 30 seconds. Uh, it also, could, could be a tremendous time sink for the city council. And I, I do hear the policy concern that I believe some of the, the council members have expressed related to the property tax levy, the perception of what this MFTE program is. And I, I hear the, um, I certainly heard the discussion around the town center moratorium, the desire to, as I understood it, increase retail space south of Southeast 29th or explore that question at least. Uh, and, you know, a, a growing concern in my tenure here around regional growth and its impact on Mercer Island and quality of life. That, that's a very complicated balancing act. This MFTE program is one component of that balancing act. Uh, so I don't know if this helps you, Councilmember Rosenbaum, but I think these are the policy issues that you're seeking to balance here as you uh, as you make your decision on what to do with this program. Yeah, I guess what I'm getting at, you know, if you look at the, and I know you're not prepared to talk about this, so I'm sorry to keep bringing it up, but, you know, if you look at the document that you sent us today that actually lists the MFT units that are brought out, what I'm sort of unclear is, like, 
in some of these other cities that have had these MFT units, how do their codes in terms of, you know, percent requirements, do those other sort of rules exist there? I'm just trying to understand what that interplay is. Um, and yeah. I understand I'm putting you in the spot here, so I'm not expecting an answer, but just for full disclosure. So in, in very general terms, the requirement to provide a percentage of affordable housing in a town center is a, so that, that idea of inclusionary zoning, including affordable housing as a component, uh, that is a common feature in many uh, jurisdictions. It's not universal, um, but it is certainly present in some of the jurisdictions in that table. Uh, and there are other tools that would be relevant to that discussion. The challenge with the question I think you're asking, Councilmember Rosenbaum, is that the set of constraints established, for example, by the, the city of Kirkland on constructing a new mixed use or multifamily project are not the same set of constraints that we place in our town center on Mercer Island. So the financial incentives or the requirements to provide public benefits are not readily compared cross jurisdiction. For example, uh, Mercer Island limits its tallest mixed use buildings, I believe, to five stories in the TC5 sub area designation. That is shorter in terms of height than some other jurisdictions. And effectively, that translates into less financial return for mixed use development for potentially a higher land cost. When you're thinking of incentivizing a public benefit, that financial return on the part of the developer is relevant when you're considering adding an additional public benefit such as affordable housing to your balance. So I, I appreciate the, the desire to evaluate the MFTE program across jurisdictions. To do that effectively, I think you're, you're describing really a much larger conversation than we could engage in tonight or on July 21st. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Reynolds. Yeah, I just want to make a couple of comments. One is I, I, I really take to heart Evan's comment about complicated balancing act. And, and I think that comes back to a comment that I made earlier that we have problems in town center and we're looking at pulling out one Jenga cube or whatever that holds up the balance and without considering the project holistically. And I, and I just, I think that's a major mistake. I'd also like to note that, um, you know, we have a problem with the lack of affordable housing. There's no doubt of that in my mind. And I, I, I'm wary of pulling out a weapon that's in our arsenal without proposing an alternative. Um, Council Member Nice pointed out, and he, he may be right, I want to look at this more carefully, he may be right that it would be more effective to just give everybody rent subsidies instead. If that's the case, and I'm not yet convinced it is, but if it is, okay, let's come forward with a plan to do that if we truly think that's a better alternative. And, and I'm just not prepared to, to take out this one tool unless we have something that is at least as good or at least as effective at taking its place. I think that's a step backwards towards addressing a very real problem on the island. Um, last thing, just a small comment that I'll make, this has been referred to several times as a, as a subsidy for developers. I, I think it's more important to think of it as a subsidy for owners. Um, because this is an eight year property tax exemption. If the developer doesn't own the property for eight years, they're not getting this tax benefit or they're not getting much or most of that tax benefit. The owners are, and in particular, if they're people that if these are condominiums, the people that buy the condominiums are the ones that are getting the tax benefit. If they're apartments, uh, you know, maybe indirectly the apartment dwellers are, but it's the apartment building owner, not the, which is not necessarily the developer that will get the tax benefit. So that's just an, an important distinction that I'd like to make, but again, uh, I, I think it's a mistake to take a, a half a half planned solution to a problem without having an alternative solution in mind, especially since we don't really have hard evidence here that we understand who's paying for this. Um, Evan's got some information from March, but hasn't been able to successfully point to us uh, any code that identifies how that subsidy process works. And so I, I don't think we understand what's actually happening here and where the money's flowing yet. I think it would be a mistake to make a decision without that full information. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Nice. Evan, I wanted to ask you another couple questions. The, the MFTE only applies to a unit which is a rental, is that correct? Uh, that is how the program is currently set up, yes. 
So an MFT would never enter the nexus in a condo in a in a owned unit environment. It's only in a multifamily rental environment that this is applicable. I, I believe I believe you're correct, Councilmember Nice. The um, so the units that are described in the MFT program are rental units. Of course, the the residential building, the multifamily building, would be owned by a property owner who would see that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the end, you said the program is an eight year or 10 year, uh, maybe there was a 12 year, depending on which zone that you were in and what you, units you provided. At the end of that term, do the units cease to exist? Uh, no, council member niece, they would remain as affordable units. These would be permanent uh, affordable units and uh, you know, a nuance here. Uh, we described the Hadley building as our example and the approximately 607,000 tax reduction for that project. That would be in that example for eight years, the public benefit, if you will, of 138,000, uh, which is related to the reduced uh, rental rate would be in perpetuity for the life of the building. Yeah. So, um, the difference between the height incentive is that in this scenario, the MFTE transfers the burden to the remaining rate payers. And in the height incentive, uh, the island residents give up the airspace, the, the additional uh, views or um, quality of life of not having five stories there and having two stories there, for example, uh, and to have the, the unit there in perpetuity. Effectively, I, I know some might be 70%, some might be 60%, but in terms of the affordable units. Uh, so is it your advice that if you were designing this incentive today, knowing that you had the height incentive on the books, that you would ever allow a developer to double dip and put 60% uh, affordable housing units in and claim the height incentive? I, I don't think I could make a recommendation to that effect to you today, Councilmember Nice, in part because I, I think what we're essentially doing is monetizing public benefits and comparing that with the construction costs on the part of the developer. And that height assessment you just described should be balanced against other public benefits which we might incentivize through property taxes. One of the, one of the changes um, uh, in state law has actually been to broaden the definition of public benefit to not just be tied to uh, affordable housing, for example. And again, I, I realize I'm making the conversation a little bit more complicated. My point being, it's not possible, I don't believe tonight, to make a recommendation of the sort that you just described. It's not been fully uh, thought through. Right. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a few more hands raised, I guess, um, but perhaps uh, if somebody wants to entertain a motion or maybe I'll entertain a motion so we can see if we can bring this to a conclusion or, you know, obviously people can make amendments to the motion that is made. So Jake, uh, you had your hand up earlier wanting to- Yeah, I, I, I did and I will make the motion, but before I do that, I'd yes. just like to express publicly the appreciation that I have, and I'm sure the city council has, Evan, for your service for this island. And uh, uh, you certainly have our wishes for continued good health, happiness, and, and fulfillment in your professional career. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you, council member. Uh, so I'm ready for a motion, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, okay. which is, I move that we set ordinance uh, number 20-C14 for a second reading and adoption on July 21, 2020. I'll second it. So it's been moved by council member Jacobson and seconded by council member Anrol to uh, set ordinance number 20-C-14 repealing chapter 4.50 of uh, the code relating to the multifamily property tax exemption for second reading and adoption on consent for July 21. Is there any further discussion or any amendments to this motion?
I would like to perhaps um, suggest an amendment um, that um, the ordinance be set aside for a second reading for July 21, 2020 and not put on consent. Second. So I guess I will speak to the amendment. I, I personally have some reservations about the adequacy or the efficacy of this multifamily uh, tax exemption, but it seemed clear to me during the very good discussion and numerous questions that we had, uh, a number of council members also have questions regarding um, some of the policy reasons for it. And there seemed to be some additional questions that perhaps if we had more time, um, Evan perhaps could have provided some additional information so I'm a little hesitant about putting this on consent. Uh, obviously it could go on consent and somebody could remove it from consent. Uh, I understand that, but I think um, at this point, I'd rather have it come up for a second reading, which would give people time to have further thoughts about it and perhaps the city uh, staff to provide us some additional information. Mr. Mayor, your uh, suggestion is acceptable to me who made the motion. We'll go ahead then, and again, we are only voting on the amendment to the main motion, which is to set this <clears throat> for a second reading for July 21, 2020. Uh, City Clerk, please take the roll. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Reynolds. Just, I, I wanna hear the confirmation again. So this is the, we're voting on the amendment, not the main motion, correct? Uh, you're voting on the, yes, that's correct. Okay, I, I will vote yes. Council member Rosenbaum. Aye. Deputy mayor Weicker. Aye. Council member Neese. Aye. Mayor Wong. Aye. Council member Anderall. Aye. And council member Jacobson. Aye. Thank you. So now we are to the main motion as amended. So the motion now reads, uh, set ordinance number 20-14 repealing chapter 4.50 of the Mercer State Code related to the multifamily housing property tax exemption for second reading, I guess really on July 21, 2020. Are you ready for a vote, Mr. Mayor? Can I ask, can I ask a, a question here? Yes. So Evan, I sort of asked you this before, but you know, we're, we're sort of moving forward. It sounds like we're moving forward here, you know, and to have another discussion about this in two weeks. I mean, does your team have the capacity to, to do more of this research? I, mean, I, just, I think we can get into this more in our next item, but this is sort of what concerns me about adding things kind of ad hoc, um, where obviously you're you're departing and, and I, I hope we'll have a chance to, to say thank you at a later date, but. Will you have an opportunity to, to do some more work on this in the next next 10 days here? Uh, Council member Rosenbaum, I was hyperventilating over the same question. <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate the question. I, as I, I've heard a number of questions tonight. In particular, I heard the mayor's question related to the shifting of the tax burden. Uh, and I understand several council members may may need more information related to that. I will do my best to try and answer that question and any other specific questions between now and July 21st. Uh, I, I will be frank with you. I think this is a conversation you may want to have with the city manager after you finish the item. Yeah, I mean, I just wonder, you know, Council Member Andrew mentioned this before about someone investing, you know, I think, you know, if someone were to do that, they, they might have wanted to do that last couple of weeks, you know, I think it was, I think it was about a month ago and we sort of moved this going forward. Um, so I just want to make sure we, we're not sort of back here in two weeks saying, hey, you know, I have more questions than we need answers to. So I'm not sure if two weeks is appropriate. Um, I just, I think we have to have real, realistic expectations about when we can get answers to these questions. Council Member Rosenbaum, Mayor, may I make one further comment? Yes. I, I do think it's possible to uh, flag this for further discussion at a later date, whether or not the city council decides to change the, you know, to repeal this program. 
and it may make sense as you're looking at the work plan with the city manager to identify this as a work plan item at a later date. The, the program is not that complicated to reestablish, uh, though it would require planning commission review, presumably and city council adoption. So I, I, I always will advise you that in my opinion, thoughtful uh, deliberation is appropriate and almost nothing is ever set in stone. Wise words, Evan. Um, okay, um, any other comments or questions before the city clerk takes roll? Hearing none or seeing none. Oh, Deputy Mayor White. Right, so I would just add that this hasn't been used in nine years since it was adopted. And again, I think if we can add this to our January retreat, as we look at other town center work and get through this moratorium, uh, there's no urgency here. We can get more information. We can hire a new development services director. We can get through this COVID pandemic and our budget craziness that's coming this fall. So. I, I would be more than willing to look at this in a broader context into the next year in in relation to all the other work we want to do with the town center economic development and development standards and all of that. So I hear Evan and I think that's a great idea given everything else on our plate and our very limited resources at this point. So I still don't support this amendment right here right now. Um, and I, I think it can wait. So thank you, Evan, for that and Jesse. Thank you for adding it to your discussion points later as this comes forward. Okay, we do have a motion uh, on the table. It's been seconded. So, uh, City Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Anderall. I vote in favor of the motion to um, repeal the MFTE to be brought back for a second reading on July 21st, 2020. Council member Jacobson. Aye. Council member Neese. Aye. Council member Reynolds. Nay. Council member Rosenbaum. Aye. Deputy Mayor Weicker. Nay. And Mayor Wong. Aye. Thank you very much. It was a great discussion. And, and hopefully, Evan, I know if not you, uh, hopefully members of your, your staff can provide some answers to a lot of the questions that came forward. And I, I think, again, speaking on behalf of the council, we do appreciate all the hard work that you've spent uh, on behalf of the community during the past four years. Um, it is almost seven o'clock. We've been at it for two hours and the next item is a very hefty, meaty one. So I'm going to suggest we take a 10 minute break or so and come back at, uh, how about we come back at 7.05? Okay. Thank you.
Okay, Mayor Wong, yeah, we are yeah. back live. Great, okay, we're back from recess. Uh, we move now to the second item of regular business, agenda 772, city manager's recommendation on modified 2020 work plan. Uh, before uh, city manager begins, uh, I just wanna make a few comments. Uh, because of the volume of materials that will be presented tonight and the need to go through the materials in an orderly manner, the city manager will be presenting the 2020-2021 work plan for each department in the order that they appear on exhibit one uh, to the uh, agenda bill. After her presentation about the department's work plan, council members will be given an opportunity to ask clarifying questions with respect to that department's work plan. After clarifying questions have been asked by the council, we will spend time discussing among ourselves to determine if there is general agreement in support of the proposed work plan. After each department's work plan has been discussed, we will then circle back uh, to the council and entertain any new item that a council member wants to propose be added to a department's work plan. We can then have a council discussion on whether a new item should be added. With that process in mind, uh, our city manager, Jesse Bond, will begin her presentation with the administrative services. Jesse. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Wong. And council, I just wanna clarify, I am actually not planning on going through uh, each work plan in detail. I thought what we would do is just walk through each one. And if you have a specific question, uh, either myself or one of the staff members on the meeting is, is happy um, to address that question. Uh, so let's dive in and then we'll, we'll get to discussion in just a minute. Uh, so just as a reminder, at the end of January, we had our annual city council planning session. Uh, at that uh, meeting, we had all uh, welcomed three new council members and uh, we covered a lot of topics. Uh, the two that I really want to focus on tonight are the 2020-21 city council priorities and uh, work plans. So at uh, the February 4th city council meeting, after your planning session concluded, uh, you did adopt uh, three priorities and they are here on your screen. In, in just a moment, we'll be talking about um, if we should amend these priorities, I did propose a priority number four given the pandemic, so I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, on February 4th at that council meeting, you also reviewed a list of additional work items. Uh, I've screenshotted just uh, uh, the top of that document that's in your packet. Uh, all of these items came out of a decision card exercise we uh, concluded at the planning session and you affirmed the new work items on February 4th. I included this document just re for reference and added uh, a July 7th status update for each of those new work items so you know where they stand. Um, and finally, um, in your packet, this is a screenshot of the community planning and development department work plan is all of the department work plans. Um, the, new, the new work items that you approved were incorporated into these plans as well. Um, so uh, let's dive in here. Oh, I should mention this document, the high visibility project list. Uh, I just, I put it in for reference, both the February 4th version and the July 7th version. Uh, we prepare this tool annually so that you have an idea of, you know, either the major projects or those projects that are going to require community engagement um, and we always look out three years because these are typically larger projects that, that tend to span multiple calendar years. So that document is included in your packet as well. Uh, after we did all of that fantastic work, uh, at the end of February, the first cases of COVID-19 were confirmed in our region. And we really as a city started um, actively engaging in the pandemic response. And that looked like a lot of different things. We were supporting our community, uh, supporting our small businesses, and we were also trying to figure out how to operate under um, a very dynamic and, and changing circumstance. Uh, walk down memory lane by mid-March, we had closed our facilities to the public. 
Um, all of our staff teams were impacted in some way. Uh, some began working remote, um, others were on alternative work schedules. Uh, some of our work was frankly restricted for a period of time. Park maintenance is a good example. There were really only limited functions we could perform in March and April in park maintenance, uh, which is part of the reason we fell so far behind. Um, our priority during this time shifted to maintaining essential services and responding to the pandemic. And I'll, I'll go over essential services in just a minute. Um, we also experienced immediate financial impacts and as a result implemented workforce reductions. Uh, those reductions began in March and um, continued through April and May. Uh, essential services, and, and I shared a version of this slide during the live briefings I was doing um, March, April, and May. So our priorities during this period of time have been the emergency response, uh, public safety, transportation, utilities, mental health services, and I should have also put slash emergency assistance, uh, parks, limited, um, and all the internal support services needed to sustain all of those things. Uh, that is continuing to be our focus, although we've slowly started to work on some of the work items that had been suspended. Uh, so, uh, what happened? Uh, by the end of March, I directed the staff to suspend work on all non-essential items. And this wasn't a black and white exercise. Um, as you know, Council, you'll recall, uh, we were just being pulled in a hundred different directions. and so. Over the period of several weeks, I worked with the directors and we talked about what, what we could move forward and what we couldn't. So there were some things that perhaps um, wouldn't fall into the category of essential, but if we had a consultant or the project was far enough along, we kept it going. Um, my example of that is the fire services operations study. Uh, that had already been started. It was out with a consultant. Um, there was some delays um, on their end due to pandemic impacts, but we decided to keep that going. If there were projects, uh, one example I'll use is uh, the classification and compensation study. We had gone out to an RFP, uh, we had submittals, but we suspended the work for a variety of reasons. Uh, we didn't have the funding to proceed. All of the staff positions were changing, um, and it, just, it was just a, no longer a timely project. So uh, that, that was how we got to really uh, where we are today. I'll remind you, we also canceled all of your meetings in March. And the timing is important because in March was when we were planning to come back and start scoping some of the new work items with you. Uh, so that never happened. Uh, we did resume Zoom your council meetings in April and some of our first lines of um, first action items all had to do with the pandemic. Um, so, <laughs> Everything shifted. Uh, board and commission work, I will also remind you, was suspended in March. And it's just this week that we will um, be bringing back the design commission, for example, we'll have a meeting tomorrow. Um, so the board and commission work has remained very, very limited. Okay, um, so that gets us uh, really, really briefly uh, to where we are today. Um, there's two parts to this presentation. The first is just regarding your council priorities. And then the second part is the work plan. Um, so just a reminder, you set your council priorities annually. It's, they're really, you know, generally higher level, um, intended to guide our planning and decision-making uh, in the current year and really looking ahead to the next biennium. Um, oftentimes we refer to them as key themes and again, we do revisit these annually. So as I was looking at the council priorities, I, I was debating um, whether or not to propose an amendment and I decided uh, to put priority four in. And, and here's the reason, uh, the pandemic is impacting every single bit of city operations. Um, nothing is the same as it was in February. And I think it's reasonable to assume that our, our emergency response, our operations will continue to be impacted for the foreseeable future. Um, so I did add pri priority four um, regarding providing emergency response services related to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, just to reflect on a very high level um, how our time is being spent. 
Um, City Council, what I did not do is go back and recommend any modifications to priorities one through three. Um, it may or may not be useful to go through that exercise tonight. I, I will stop talking here a minute and, and ask for your feedback. I think as I look at priority two, uh, one of the things it says is stabilize the organization. Um, certainly in February when you adopted this, that meant something different than it does to me today. And, and I will say stabilizing the organization is still a very high priority, if not one of the highest priorities at the moment, um, considering all that has happened. So this priority is still very um, relevant in my opinion. Uh, priority three, implement an economic development program. Again, this priority as I consider this, um, and we never got to the point of really vetting, uh, vetting this work, it means something different uh, certainly to me than it did in February. Um, we, we are actively um, working to support, support our small business community uh, we're, we're probably not going to work on an economic development plan right now, uh, but supporting our businesses is still a high priority and, and, and should be going forward. So at this point, Mayor Wong, I, I wanted to pause in the presentation and take a moment to talk about um, where the council is at regarding the city council priorities. Uh, and then after that discussion, we'll talk about the actual work plan. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see anybody's hand raised at the moment. Um, give it a second, but I'll, let me just chime in my, on my own here. Um, I, I personally think that the priorities one, two, and three, because they are at a very high level, uh, I, I still think that they are um, priorities of the city council and still are relevant, even though obviously the pandemic has changed a lot. I personally like the adding of the fourth priority. But again, I'm just speaking for myself. Uh, I don't know if any other council member wants to weigh in on this particular issue regarding priorities of the city council. And we can certainly move on, Mayor. This I've included this as part of your motion um, sure. at the end. Sure, that'll be, that'll be the first motion that we take up after the discussion. Okay, why don't you go ahead and talk about the modified work plans. All right, um, so just a, uh, a little written clarification. In your agenda packet, I referenced uh, the 2020 work plans. Technically, they're 2020 to 2021. So I've made that correction here in the presentation. Um, this year, we presented um, a new consolidated format for the department work plans, uh, just implemented this year. Uh, previously, we had a number of versions of work plans and we hadn't shared them with the council or the public in this format. So you're, you're used to seeing this. Uh, I've got a screenshot of the Public Works Department work plan here. Uh, it does reflect a two-year planning horizon, and that's simply because many items are, are, are crossing calendar years. Uh, we really focus mostly on the high-level work items, and we didn't include day-to-day -day work. And you'll note, as you've re-reviewed these, I'm sure page by page, uh, there is overlap between the departments. So you'll see a work item repeated in multiple departments if both departments are, are working on that. Um, so what's in your packet today? Um, I went through, worked with the directors. We provided a status update for each work item and we noted in red, uh, the screenshot here is of the Public Works Department and the update, you know, the work item was update town center parking regulations. Uh, in this case, the work item was suspended, uh, which means it's not moving forward and it's subject to further discussion and evaluation uh, by the staff and the city council. I will note in many cases, uh, there is an unmet resource need associated with the work item that is suspended. So I, I screenshotted this one in particular because several of you have said, Jesse, isn't this still a priority to get the town center parking regulations done? And I would say, yes, it absolutely is, uh, particularly ahead of the opening of the Sound Transit Station in 2023. Um, the challenge I have is that right now today, I do not have the staff resources to manage this project, nor do I have funding to hire a consultant to do the work. So, and I'll talk about in just a minute, how we should, how I would recommend we move these items forward, which is essentially to move them to the fall budget discussion. 
Uh, in some cases in the work plan, I just, and I, we probably weren't totally consistent. Um, both Amanda and I went through to, to try to improve consistency. But where you see something noted as delayed, it, it means that we're still working on it, but we're behind schedule. Uh, most things are, you know, two to three months behind schedule at least uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, if we have the new schedule, we tried to note it. Uh, where you see it a, a, a to be determined in a staff column, that indicates most likely I don't have a staff person right now to do the work. Uh, again, we've we've reduced um, staff across most departments and uh, we're really focusing on essential services right now. Okay, so my recommendation is uh, to maintain our current service levels to the end of 2020, if we can. Um, I'm assuming right now that we have some stability. It feels like we're a little more stable than we were a couple months ago. Um, just keep going with what we're doing right now and our key areas of focus, which is on essential services. Uh, my recommendation is to revisit the items that I've noted are suspended and anything that's, um, that you desire to add as a new work item as part of the 2020 budget process. Um, and here's why. <laughs> It's July. The budget process will kick off with you in September um, and we'll really get into the meat of it in October. We're just two months away. Um, and let me show you what that schedule looks like and then I'll come back to this slide. So what's happening right now is we are um, developing the department budgets and going through a review process. Uh, we're basically back to the drawing board, uh, working on base budget development, uh, really taking in everything that's changed this year, which includes, in most cases, a new organizational structure. And we are really talking about moving blocks around in a, in a very uh, meaningful and thoughtful way. Uh, my opinion is this may be one of the most important budgets we ever put together as a city. Uh, this is significant work. Uh, it is taking all of us, multiple layers of the organization, to really think through our recommendation to you as to how we go forward. That is what your staff is focusing on right now. Um, aside from what I'll just, and I won't really, I'll just say the base budget is, is basically, you know, status quo, essential services. Uh, we're also starting to put together budget propos proposals for the special projects or the work items. So just a moment ago, I talked about the work item uh, that is the town center parking regulations. I have a staff member actually preparing a scope of work and a cost estimate for that work item so that when we come to you in the fall, you will have um, a list of budget proposals to consider and we can evaluate them against you know, each other and, and in consideration of our priorities. Um, in mid-August, we will be compiling our second quarter actuals. Uh, and also I should have noted here at this point, the finance department and myself will be um, putting really starting to pull together the draft budget. Uh, when we come back from the August break, uh, the September 1st meeting, you'll have your second quarter financial status report. Uh, end of September, and I'll talk to you about this um, when we get to the planning schedule at the end of the meeting, uh, we'll be looking at our revenue forecast. You'll have a preliminary budget and the city manager's budget message. Uh, the meetings in October are budget study sessions. Uh, by the time we get to November 3rd, we'll have our third quarter financial status report. And also if there are any follow-up budget items we need to go over, we'll do those that evening. Uh, we are anticipating uh, you will adopt your budget on no November 17th. Uh, you certainly have uh, the December council meetings to fall back on if you need them. Okay, so that's, that's the high level budget calendar. So let's let's pop back here to my recommendation. As I just mentioned, my recommendation is to take the items that are suspended and anything else you want to add and plug them in to your budget process, which is just super close to kicking off. I will remind you we are still evaluating the fiscal impacts of the pandemic. Uh, uncertainty remains. I did see the sales tax report for May today. And actually, it doesn't look terrible. It's, a, it's, it's under what we budgeted, but not by much. Um, is that a trend? I don't know yet. Uh, so <laughs> a couple more months of financial data is important. 
Um, for me, and this is really what I, I want to hit home, you started to talk about it with your previous um, discussion. We need to get our staff resources and our other resources aligned uh, with the budget and the work plans. Uh, they're not aligned right now. I don't have the resources or the staffing to fulfill the work plans that we originally conceived in the early part of 2020. I just don't. I also do not have resources to take on new work items. I mean, we are at our capacity. And Council, I want to be frank with you here. Um, I'm really proud of your staff. Uh, they have been working hard, hard since March under really challenging circumstances. Uh, we have to make sure we keep we keep things manageable and realistic or we are going to start burning them out. Uh, we maybe already have. Um, so please keep that in mind as we have our discussion. I also need to mention that I, I think simply put, priorities may have changed. The pandemic has certainly had an impact on a number of things. One of the work items that stood out to me as I went through the plans was um, the shuttle, right? The, the request had been to look at a shuttle um, on Mercer Island. And given the pandemic, you know, people aren't sharing transportation right now. So that, that may just not be the most relevant item for right now. It could be something that's more relevant in two years. Uh, so things have definitely shifted. And finally, I need to mention this, this is super important. We, we have to remember that it's not just staff resources, it's also city council meeting time, board and commission capacity and our community capacity to engage on new initiatives. Uh, Council, your schedule is full through the end of the year. Uh, this fall uh, will be dedicated to your budget discussion. Uh, board and commissions are really still mostly stood down. Uh, how we activate them going forward will depend on our work plan discussion tonight. Uh, I still have a staffing challenge, right? Um, if, if you decided, for example, to move forward with some parks policy work, I don't have any parks administration staff right now. Um, and then a final comment on community capacity. I think it's important to remember that uh, this pandemic is affecting everybody. And I'm really sensitive to how much um, and, and the pace at which we tackle new work items, considering that we want our community to have the capacity to be engaged. Um, and everybody's dealing with um, their own circumstances related to the pandemic as well. Uh, so that actually concludes my presentation. Uh, the motions are here. And what we had discussed yesterday uh, with Mayor Wong, um, Deputy Mayor Weicker and Council Member Jacobson was just, uh, if the council desires to ask questions about individual work plans, I'm, I'm happy uh, to take to help help facilitate that discussion and walk through them now. Oops. So again, because there are a number of these work plans, and again, uh, to avoid jumping around, you know, Jesse, why don't you go ahead and just lead us through? And if anybody has a question, you know, for instance, the first one is the administrative services. You know, um, maybe. Sure. You go ahead and ask. I don't see, uh, we have Council Member Rosenbaum's hand is up. Thanks, Jesse. Can I just ask a question? So, should we expect that? So, the document that we have that has the individual work plans on it is that going to be updated prior to the budget discussion? Because it seems that my, my guess here is that there's a lot of things that are not going to be above the line. Um, so, is, is that? I just want to understand sort of the process so we yeah. can make yeah. those determinations. Uh, my vision is that when we conclude, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work backwards here a little bit, Councilmember Rosenbaum, when we conclude and when we've adopted our 2021-22 budget, we will have in effect also adopted our work plan. Um, it would not make sense then to go to the planning session and talk about new work items, right? Um, it's not an election year. We should be able to set the work plan via the budget process this fall. So yes, uh, in fact, I have a meeting with the leadership team tomorrow um, after this discussion concludes and we will talk about doing a couple things calendaring the remaining work items for 2020 building our schedule uh, particularly this fall and then uh, talking about how we prepare budget proposals for all these items that we didn't get to this year to move forward as part of your 
your process consideration. So yes, these plans will be updated. They will say 2021, 20, 22, um, and be part of your budget. Okay, I, to the extent possible, it'd be helpful just to keep whatever gets dropped off the list to have that somewhere in the document too, just so we can get a sense of, okay, this didn't make it above the line this time, but still was a priority at some point. So when we work on this in the future, we can text them a reference back. Well, and I will remember, I will remind you that um, it will be your decision to drop things off the list, primarily not mine, unless it's, unless, unless we have something on here that's just truly operational. Um, most of these will be up for discussion as part of your budget. Yeah, I just mean, but also the capacity, I imagine that we had when we made a lot of these lists in January is significantly diminished. Yeah. Right. Uh, so the first work plan is administrative Agreed. services. This is yes, a, a Deputy Mayor Weicker has her hand raised. Just a quick question, because Jesse, in that previous slide, you had listed uh, property tax levy 2021 potentially for November 17th, and I don't remember where it was in this whole packet of work plans, but do you want to just talk about that briefly at the highest level? Because I think this is the first time that's ever been on anything official. Actually, we, we do set the property tax levy when we, when we set the budget. I think we actually have to do it um, annually. So that, that's, not, uh, that's not a new levy, that's just Part Business of our budget process. Yeah. Okay. So. And great. Jesse, go ahead and um, begin the, the discussion on, for instance, on administrative services work plan. Sure. So, so high level administrative services. Um, this is largely a combination of divisions uh, led by Allie Speets. Um, Allie had a family matter tonight. I think she's going to try to join us for this discussion. So, oh, there she is. So I'm here. <laughs> it um, entails uh, human resources, uh, IGS, uh, facilities is shown here, although I suspect in our reorganizational um, analysis, facilities may move. Um, what am I missing, Allie? That's it. Uh, heavy, heavy project load across IT and GIS teams. Um, Allie and I are still prioritizing the human resources work. It's really foundational um, to setting us up for success in the next biennium. Uh, obviously one item that won't go forward this year, but I would recommend for next year is the class and comp study. Um, I mentioned already, there's no point doing it. Uh, we don't even know what positions we have at this moment, uh, but hopefully we will next year and it would be good um, to do that work. So I don't have any comments um, on this plan other than that. Allie, did you want to say anything? Um, you know, I think that uh, for HR, the big push is, um, as we talked about earlier in the year, um, the payroll audit and then getting NeoGov, which is our new software system for HR and uh, payroll off the ground. Um, we've got some staff helping us out doing that. So I, that's pretty much what our focus is right now. Um, IT has been Coming. They have been doing a great job. Um, and so I, I think we're just, um, we're, we're moving. Uh, I think the class and comp study is, is going to be extremely important, but it just, it's not going to work right now. So I think next year, it'll be a good time to do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Rosenbaum. Thanks, Allie. On, the, um, on page five of eight under the COVID-19 pandemic response, Obviously this is new and I just wanna say thank you to you and the team, obviously getting everyone up and running remote is no small task. Um, going from City Hall to working at home is, is obviously challenging. Um, how far along are we on that? I mean, is this, obviously this is an ongoing issue that you're I'm sure identifying challenges as they go, but is this, has the staff sort of settled into a new rhythm or are you expecting additional expenses um, related to telework and things like that? Um, I actually don't expect uh much more expense, expenses in terms of having people work remotely. Um, with the layoffs and the reduction in workforce, we have had um, equipment that has not, that's been turned back in. So we're repurposing as much of that as possible. Um, I think one of the things that we're finding is um, an expense that, we, that may be ongoing are hotspots. Right, so we have staff that live far away, or you know, out in areas where they don't have good service, or they're sharing service with other family members. Um, so that's where our expense has gone up, and then that's 
Um, that coupled with um, leadership team all receiving city issued cell phones, um, that is that's where our monthly costs will go up. But I don't think equipment wise we'll have much more expenses. Um, just our regular replacement and then any backup needs that we need. Thank you. Yeah. Jesse and Allie, I have one question. As far as um, not it, basically the, the decision making process that you guys use to set the priorities, I, I know that there are some of the grayed out, gray out areas are identified as high priorities. Um, and I'm just curious uh, what factors do you guys consider? Was it just simply staffing or, or were there other factors? That Could we, you give me an example of one that you're talking about? Well, you know, for instance, the, the uh, I think it was, I'm sorry, I should have had it. Uh, That's okay. The, the, the master, the, the fee schedule, yeah, the master fee schedule was one. Right. There things that, I'm just curious whether or not there were things that were um, grayed out that might have revenue impact. So I, yeah. So the, with the master fee schedule, the purpose of that was to take all of our different fee schedules that we have and put it into one state, into one place, and actually adopt it into our code. Um, we have resolutions for all of these, or we have them set by different staff members. And so the, the point for this was to bring them all together and to put them into our code so that each year the council could review and um, update any of those. Um, so yeah, it's still a high priority because it's something we really wanna do. I just have had to shift my focus to HR so I don't have as much time to do kind of the, you know, general um, city enhancements that we wanna do. I don't know, Mayor Wong, I, uh, we're still able to update individual fees. The master fee schedule, as Elliot mentioned, consolidated the fees. Uh, we were also planning to take the fees that you haven't been approving and put them into the master fee schedule because I think you should. Uh, for example, the parks and recreation fees. Um, so this will, that will be something um, that Ali and I will recommend we complete in 2021. It's, it is still a high priority. We do not have capacity to do it this year. Um, I think you'll find that most of the items that are grayed out are because we don't have the resources to do the work, just simply put. Uh, there's a handful that I, I'm not sure even makes sense at this point, but most of them are staff resource related. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody else have a question or we can move on to the next department. Okay. So the next department is the city attorney's office. And what I'll note here is most of these items um, is BO and outside legal counsel supporting other department work plan items. Um, so there's some redundancy here in this work plan and other work plans. Um, I, don't know that I have anything else to add. I, I think going forward next year, we will likely be recommending uh, continuing our structure where we have a city attorney and rather than having an assistant city attorney, we'll continue to partner with outside legal counsel, uh, which uh, kind of keeps BO in a position of steering the ship and outsourcing when we need to. Because if you look at this work plan, this is far more uh, than one city attorney can manage. Hi, Bo. Did you want to say anything else? Well, I think um, you um, hit the nail on the head there. We are a support group, um, primarily supporting other departments to make sure that the work that they do gets done correctly and uh, legally. And um, with um, you know reduction in in, in staff um, and a lot of shifting of of duties. Uh, there has been more um, demand on our office uh, by, uh, by staff um, as they learn their new roles and uh, become more secure in the decision making um, in their new, re new respective roles. So it's been, um, uh, it's, it's, there's been more work for us in the department. However, um, we, you know, expect that as again, staff becomes more, um, you know, comfortable in their new positions um, uh, that will sort of ramp down as before. I, I don't, Thank you. Hands up, but I guess I want to ask a question regarding 
the so uh, sign code amendments, and I thought that we needed to update that particular code. I know it's been on the work plan, but you know I don't know how crucial it is and whether or not we don't update the sign code, whether or not we're at risk to some level or, or to some degree. Well, let me just say that um, you know right now we are managing the risk um, in different ways, uh, primarily in enforcement. Um, but uh, this is work that needs to be done eventually. Um, okay. I, when uh, when the new planning director comes on board, you know, we, we can't keep kicking the sign code update down the road. We have to get it done. So as we start our budget process this fall, I will be asking you to make sure we have that that's prioritized as a 2021 item. Um, most other cities have done the work. We're a little behind. No, oh, I, I appreciate that. I just, again, just concerned about whether or not we're at risk or have any exposure, but it sounds like, according to the city attorney, it's being managed. Um, Council Member Adderall. Oh, Lisa, you're muted. <laughs> of course I am. Um, it seems like the sign code is kind of a, a, a discreet little bucket of work that could maybe be assigned realistically to outside council um so it just some your thoughts on that bo or jesse and then the, the other thing is and i know this is on the city attorney work plan and also on the police department work plan the um regulations relating to camping on public property i i, I get that it's suspended i get that there's a lot of important stuff that's suspended i, I feel really strongly that that is you know under priority number one for the council to um, prepare for growth and development and the advent of light rail. And so um, I'd, I guess I'd just like to see it as, you know, if it's on the B list, I'd like it to be number one on the B list. If it's not on the A list. I, I haven't, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I haven't gone back and done any reprioritization work. Council Member Anderl, I. I anticipate all of these suspended items will roll forward uh, to the budget discussion. And again, you know, one of my goals is to get, we should be putting the work plan items in front of you to make sure we <coughs> properly resource them. Uh, I will mention, I am in complete agreement with you about using outside legal counsel to help draft um, some of these code amendments. In fact, BO and I have talked about it at length. Um, we just have to have the funding to do it. And, and frankly, it, like the sign code is a perfect example. In my opinion, it would be more efficient uh, to engage them with the drafting up front rather than having staff draft the code. We're working with uh, a firm right now, Madrona Law, and turns out they've done a lot of the sign code work for other cities. So um, that is how, as we work to rebuild uh, uh, the priorities and the path for 21-22, that's something BO and I will certainly be looking at as how to be more efficient in that regard. Great, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Weicker. Yeah, Jesse, I was just wondering where the moratorium lands on this work plan. I didn't see it in the city manager or city attorney. I saw some reference to it over in community and economic development. I, I did not get it updated across all the work plans. It certainly hits those departments that you mentioned. It is right now in the um, uh, planning department work plan. Okay. And just a quick process check on uh, moratorium and town center code work. Your next step there is a public hearing on July 21st. Uh, likely uh, we turn around an agenda item on August 4th. Uh, to basically confirm the findings uh, for the moratorium. I think I said that almost correctly. And then in August, we'll be looking at um, issuing an RFP back in front of you in September-ish, uh, looking to uh, award a contract to a consultant and we need to appropriate the funds to do the work. Uh, so we have to figure out where those resources are coming from and then we'll be on our way with the code work. Okay, as long as it doesn't get lost. It's, it's not lost. We just had a staff <laughs> meeting on it today. Okay. I assure you. Great, thank you. Um, so, any, any other questions regarding the city attorney's office? Let's call ahead now, Jesse. All right, so the city manager's office, and I should know it looks like these are in alphabetical order. Um, 
Uh, the city manager's office includes high level projects that I'm working on. Uh, also includes the city clerk's office. It includes communications and sustainability. Uh, I'll note just a couple of things. Obviously, we're still working on, uh, actively working on sound transit issues. Um, this, this one item that's on uh, the first page of the city manager's office, evaluating permanent protections for parks and open space, uh, just there's, there's no capacity to do that. So we'll have to revisit that as part of the budget. Um, the commuter parking and mixed use project, uh, council will be talking about more in the coming weeks. Uh, just to confirm, uh, I did stop working on that project in March and um, we haven't done any uh, work on it since. Uh, one of the things that I'm working through right now as part of your budget recommendations is we have currently an FTE that splits time uh, between communications and sustainability. Uh, this year is a perfect example of what happens to sustainability when communications demands are high. Um, Ross Freeman has really had no capacity to do sustainability work. He, he's doing a little bit as time allows, but the communication demand has been intense and sustained. And so we're evaluating options um, um, so that we can have a sustainability work plan that uh, we can deliver on in the next biennium. Uh, nothing to say there except that most of the sustainability work is not going to be done this year um, or delayed pretty seriously. Uh, Deb, our city clerk, had a really ambitious um, goal of getting a whole bunch of public records work done and uh, most of her time has been going to uh, meetings and adapting to the pandemic. So a lot of that work will slide, it's still a priority. We're, we're gonna continue to chip away at it. Um, I also wanna mention economic development is in the city manager's work plan. And I already said in February, where I thought we would be heading with economic development planning work is very different than where we are today. Uh, we have a position that's funded right now that was on our work plan. It, it happened under totally different circumstances. Um, but I think this fall, we should really talk about where do we go from here. Um, economic development work is very dynamic and shifting right now. So I, I would not wanna jump into something that's very static, that wouldn't make sense. Um, but engaging our community, our business community, and helping them is, is still a priority. Um, I think that's all I have on the city manager's work plan. Deputy Mayor Weicker, your hands up. Oh, hands down. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions regarding the city manager's office? Okay. I see none. All right. This feels a little bit like death by work plan discussion. So I'll try to pick it up a little bit here. <laughs> Um, community planning and development. We have a couple things going on here. Uh, we've had workforce reductions. Uh, that department is largely focusing on permits. Uh, the A to Z of permits and customer service, uh, sustaining code enforcement work. Really all of, all or most of the policy work that was on their plate has been suspended. This is further impacting, impacted by the departure of Evan, our planning director. Um, so we'll be looking at how to, how to reprioritize this work going forward. And uh, certainly I'd like to have the new director involved um, so that they can get their fingerprints on all of this. Um, any questions? Can I ask a, uh, yeah, let me ask a question then. This is uh, on item, work item number seven. Um, this is page 28 of exhibit one. Um, I'm just curious about this urban growth capacity analysis. It's being suspended. Sure, Evan, you wanna talk about that? Uh, yeah, I, I think actually that's, that's no longer true. It was temporarily suspended when we had a, a workforce reduction. Uh, I understand Robin's actually just picked it up in the last week or so. Uh, we have some uh, county mandated timelines to complete that capacity report. And, you know, we're monitoring the timelines to ensure that we don't uh, run afoul of, of the county's uh, requirement. So is that analysis gonna be done in 2020 or? 
Uh, so the, the urban growth capacity analysis will be done in 2020, but the timeline for establishing growth targets uh, has shifted out, out of, by and large, out of 2020 into 2021, 2022. Uh, the state modified the overall timeline for amending the comprehensive plan. The major update for the comprehensive plan was scheduled in 2023, and they bumped it out to 2024. And so everything that kind of stacks up behind it has also shifted out, which is good given uh, all of the all of the struggles uh, the jurisdictions in this area are having with uh, with COVID. Uh, just not the ability for staff to focus on this discussion at the moment. Thank you for that update. Uh, anybody else uh, with a question regarding the CPD? Okay, I guess we move on to the finance department. Sure. Uh, and Matt Mornick is not able to join us tonight. He's got a, a sick kiddo at home. So the Juan Tuttle is here. And I just want to pause and extend my thanks to Juan for somehow pulling a rabbit out of a hat and getting those um, annual financial statements done. Uh, one of the departments most significantly impacted by the pandemic and in increased workload has been the finance department. We have been pulling them all over the place uh, to support us um, in lots of decision making. So thank you, Luan, uh, for that miracle. <laughs> um, so I, I really think the, the key here is we are turning our attention to the budget. Uh, there were a number of policies that you had asked us to evaluate this year. Some of them we will be able to do. Some of them are probably beyond what we have capacity for this fall. Uh, so an example is we do wanna work on and I cannot put my fingers on it, the uh, personnel uh, position funding policies. Um, there's a, a policy regarding uh, surplusing equipment that probably has to move out till next year. Uh, we really wanted to work on the financial software system. That's gonna have to be deferred. It's a pretty major project. Uh, so what we're trying to do is make a lot of space for our finance department to focus on the budget because it is a big lift. Uh, we are a little bit behind. We're working on getting caught up and it's gonna look different than it has in the years past pretty si significantly. Juan, what did I miss? A whole lot. No, I think you covered it. Budget has to be, I think, the priority and as much as we can fold in some of the outstanding policies that need to be updated into that process, I think it will be the best step forward and those that we can't roll into budget, I think we'll look to do in the next year. So. Right. Uh, Thank you very much for all the hard work, uh, Luan. You know, sure. so, uh, I see no hands raised. All right, let's keep going. Uh, we are on to fire and uh, next week, and I think Chief is here somewhere in the background. It's kind of funny how everybody just appears and disappears. <laughs> there he is. Hi, Steve. Um, really high level, I, you know, the fire department, uh, my thanks to all the staff and leadership, they've had to adapt uh, pretty significantly their operations to ensure the staff are safe. Uh, call volumes have been steady. We've had moments where they've been a little higher than normal. Uh, one of the work items that is moving forward is the fire operations study. I'm not sure, Chief, even what we're formally calling that. Uh, that will be coming back to you a week from today for discussion. Um, Chief, anything else you want to add about the work plan? No, I, I think we've made all the updates. We're getting back into the groove now that things are settling down from COVID and how we're going to uh, continue in our response mode, uh, dis despite the fact that everything's opening back up and the policies that we're gonna keep in place. And so uh, we're starting to get back to what we would consider normal, which is uh, putting together some of the programs like the mobile integrated health. We're prepping for a promotional examination, which takes a lot of work this fall, uh, those sorts of things. Chief, I know that uh, there was, uh, I saw an email, but maybe you might want to elaborate on the mobile integrated health um, work item. I think there was a question regarding whether or not um, that financing is at risk if we don't uh, meet certain requirements. It is not. That was one of the first things that we checked when this uh, became available. We knew it was going to be 
a challenge with our limited staffing to put a program in place. And so the city is allotted a, uh, our, we already know the numbers for the next six years through the King County EMS levy. And so the funds that we are allotted this year, it's 105,000 and some change will carry over into next year. And I believe those funds are at 110,000 and some change. And so uh, as we move forward and put this together, the, the funds will be there for us uh, to have a very good program that I think will be very effective for the citizens. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, we move on to the police department. Uh, All right, I know Chief Holmes is uh, also available. Thank you, Chief Heitman. Um, again, you know, I, another department that's been pretty significantly impacted by the pandemic is uh, police, not only changing our operations, uh, but having to respond to many, many, many calls um, still today um, for support uh, and uh, COVID-19 uh, regulations. Chief, what else can you say about your work plan? Well, good evening, council members. Um, we've tried to maintain the items that were either in process or were pushed up to the front by our uh, council members themselves or by Jesse. We, we've tried to do this in a logical way, acknowledging that you know our uh, capacity looks a whole lot different than it did during the council retreat. So. Um, what you see there, I, I don't know that it's of value to go through every one of these, but again, we have tried to accomplish the ones we can and uh, leave a little bit of capacity to take on some of the unexpected stuff that doesn't appear on the work plan. Beyond that, I am happy to answer questions or uh, dig into some of these a little deeper. I uh, don't, I'm not seeing anybody's hand. I'm gonna ask you a question, Chief the emergency operations center so this is at the uh, top of page uh, 43 um, it says that 80 percent of the improvements have been completed uh, and it's obviously 20 percent ha has not so i'm just curious what has not been completed and would it take that much of an effort to complete it i'm not even sure what we're talking about in terms of improvements this is a um, yeah go ahead chief it's a facilities project Yeah, and Jennifer gave me some details a couple months ago. And uh, Mayor, I don't have those details in front of me. I think we're pretty close. Um, I think it was just simply a, uh, the capacity for facilities folks to address these things. I'll just okay. note on uh, facilities projects in general, uh, we did layoffs did affect the facilities department. We've been, um, you know, temporarily. Uh, Band-aiding through the EOC um, facility operations and projects, uh, but most of our capital projects for facilities are deferred unless they're critical. I think, the, Ms. Uh, Mayor, I think part of this had to do with um, the entrance room processing. When you go into the EOC, there was a little section of a wall. I think they wanted to knock out and turn into a door. So s some things like that. The EOC can function as is, but it's more of a to get it. Deal state. There's a few things that'd be nice to have, but uh, certainly we are able to postpone those for right now. Great. I mean, that's obviously the key is it doesn't impact the operations at all. So, our I should mention too, our facilities work. It's probably not called out here. Is really focusing on COVID-19 adaptations. So we're turning our attention right now to municipal court uh, to make sure that we have uh, the infrastructure in place so that they can operate safely. Things like. Um, sneeze guards uh, so that is where uh, and, and we have multiple people helping with facilities projects right now that's where our energy is headed great uh, council member uh, Reynolds Greg you're muted yeah got it off sorry uh, just question for the chief about the uh, school resource officer and the interlocal agreement being updated there there's been some broader national and local pressure about whether the school resource officer position should exist and what form it should take. And I, I'm not going to take a stand on that either way right now, but I'm just wondering if as part of that interlocal negotiation, are, are you revisiting that and talking about that and considering what the program should look like and if it should exist? Yes, in brief, I have had conversations with the superintendent 
um, you know, the program's been in place since 1996. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of value there. I think in short, I would just say this, if I could summarize the program up, well, in as, in as few different sentences, I would certainly include this one. And that would be that uh, one of the main goals of that program is to keep kids out of the criminal justice system. And I really do believe it depends on uh, sort of the, the officer you have and the expectations of that officer. And I understand concerns people have had just in passing about, well, I'll have a cop in the school and there's some concerns about arrests going way up. That is completely not the point of the program. Um, if our current, if uh, Detective Munoz, if he arrests maybe one student a year, maybe out of the school, maybe. So um, I think different communities have different issues with the SRO program, uh, perhaps a different approach. Um, I was our first SRO in 96. And it was really important to me to sort of set the tone of that program uh, such that this is all about coming to the uh, support of the kids and the students. I shouldn't say uh, kids, but students and staff at the schools, the teachers, and even the parents, and really being a liaison between YFS, the school district, and the police department. So um, we, we have pretty clear sense about the program here not being enforcement heavy by any means. Uh, I taught math classes. I even taught in a French class and I don't even know how to speak French. I mean, we had a lot of fun trying to get um, the officer in front of the kids, uh, the students, trying to get FaceTime, uh, really working on relationship. And um, I, I have felt it to be strongly supported. I understand the questions um, that have come up recently, given some of the concerns in our uh, surrounding or even national other jurisdictions, but certainly for Mercer Island here, um, and, and I've also heard of the safety element that it gives. So I think there's a, a lot there. The superintendent did talk about during this next negotiation period to rather than have this interlocal just automatic be renew, to have it be something we would revisit every year, similar to the school counselors. So every year we would revisit the SRO contract. And if there are hard questions to ask and get answered, that would be the time to do it. So it's not just something that gets lost anymore. It would be an annually recurring um, event and I would support that. So that's about, you know, I, I'm not sure if that answers all your questions, but that's about where I think this would land just on a, at a quick response without going deep into the whole program itself. Uh, that, that's very helpful. I just want to make sure a broad discussion was happening. It sounds like it is, so thank you. Yeah. Here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, any other questions for either the chief or for city manager on the police department? Seeing none, Jesse. I guess we're on to the parks. All right. Um, so the work plan that's really probably most staggering uh, in terms of the changes is the Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, as you know, city council, we laid off a number of staff, including standing down pretty much the entirety of the recreation division. Uh, most of the Parks and Recreation oversight is now falling to Jason Kittner. Uh, we do have some park staff that are working in an EOC capacity, although I will note they've had very little time for parks and recreation work. Uh, so what you see here is a department that's largely st stood down except for core services like park maintenance. And as I noted earlier tonight, uh, resuming some field scheduling. Uh, what I would anticipate is coming to you this fall, um, we haven't, haven't really gotten the meat on the bones yet, but will be a proposal to uh, bring the community center back online, uh, probably in a phased approach in 2021. And so when I say community center, I mean recreation. Um, I am still mindful of the operating limitations uh, created by the pandemic. Uh, so we have more work to do to figure out how to stand up this department. Uh, we are not alone. Uh, many cities have basically stood down the recreation division and we're all talking about um, how we how we bring services back online and do so in a financially responsible manner. Uh, any questions for the city manager, uh, Craig? Uh, Councilman Morano, your hand is up. That was old, you can ignore me. I'm sorry, what? That, that was old, you can ignore me all Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Uh, Jesse, I think you probably have covered this before, but maybe just again to remind me, I'm looking at 
uh, work item number four, which is on page 46. Um, and I understand that a lot of these things are being suspended because of, of um, staffing uh, issues primarily. But I, I take it that the suspension does not put at risk the city's ability for grants or other funding. So the pros plan, Hi, hi, hi. Um, we had just kicked off the pros plan uh, when we had to turn, uh, we had a consultant on board, we were getting ready uh, to kick off our uh, public engagement. We had done a survey. Uh, we have the survey results. We haven't done anything with them yet. Um, so yes, not having a, a pros plan uh, current right now could impact um, a segment of our grant funding we get from the state. It does not impact the boating facility grants, which is good news because most of what we were focusing on in the future years is grants um, for our docks and our waterfront, frankly. Um, there is a component of the pros plan. The consultant we hired, uh, we asked them to do a parks infrastructure assessment, and we are going to ask them to complete that work, at least get that done. And then I really think, Mayor, I need to think through whether we resume this or, or where we go from here. We have also asked uh, RCO and we asked our representatives, um, I think uh, Tana Sen was gonna help follow up on this, uh, about some exceptions that RCO could made for, for cities that are in our position where we have a pros plan that has lapsed. Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. It's not the right time to be doing a public engagement process on your park system, frankly. Um, so we're, we're working through that. But the good news is boating facilities grants are not impacted. I'm not sure, Mayor, that I know uh, what my recommendation will be if we resume this in 2021 or not. I will note 2021 is looking pretty darn busy and we've got to balance this against our other priorities. Um, so we'll see. Okay, thank you for that update or, or, or reminder, I guess, for me. Um, Anybody else have uh, any questions regarding the parks and recreation? Um, I think we're nearing the end here. So we're now in public works, uh, Justin. Sure. And I think Jason's online somewhere here. Uh, public works has not been as impacted by workforce reductions. Again, uh, most of the public works department is funded through sources other than the general fund. Uh, what we have tried to keep going is our capital projects, uh, particularly as the bidding environment looks maybe a little more favorable than it did a year ago. Uh, I will note most of what Jason and his team are doing is keeping infrastructure operating day to day. Uh, City Council, you unfortunately receive an email from us almost weekly about something we're fixing um, and, and that is what we're up to. Uh, SCADA, the SCADA project is still a really high priority and we're, we're trying to keep that one moving forward. Jason, anything else you wanted to share about your work plan? I'll just say uh, we had some key staff transitions. So that also with a couple key manager positions, which the council is familiar with, that definitely did impact some of our work items. The SCADA project is a priority for us. Uh, as, you see, as you see in the memo, we are moving forward with it. Um, it's it's in it's a little bit in pieces uh, to get the design together because it's a lot of different pieces that make the system work. But it is that work is underway, and uh, you know our team is stabilizing back in sort of a new normal. Uh, and so I am confident that we'll continue to make good progress on that in the next six months. That project, for certainly though, it's a multi-year it's a multi-year effort given the size of it. So just to be clear about that. So one of the things that Jason and I are working on for your budget proposal this year is making sure that we have enough project management staff. Um, I think part of what's happened is we've peanut buttered capital project work out across multiple departments and divisions. Uh, it's probably not, not any longer the most efficient service delivery method. Uh, and we may not have enough horsepower. So we, we may be looking at um, a different combination of project managers going forward. Uh, maybe requesting another position. The other thing I will note is uh, the staff transitions that happened in the public works department this year reminded us that um, we have a number of very talented senior engineers at the city that are all within um, possibly three to five years of retirement and we have no bench. Uh, so one of our priorities will be as we look at a restructure, 
uh, this fall in your budget is building capacity for improved succession planning. Um, and if any of those engineers are on this call right now, uh, you're not leaving. <laughs> okay. Great, thank you. Um, any questions for Jason or for the city manager? Okay, that's gonna take us to the youth and family services. Sure. Um, last but certainly not least, YFS, another department that was pretty heavily impacted um, by COVID-19 and uh, workforce reductions. Um, I'll just note that our focus here has been on maintaining services. Um, most, many of them are at a reduced level. Uh, we are looking at, um, right now with the YFS working group, uh, funding both short-term and long-term solutions. Uh, Council, I'm, I'm actually optimistic we may be back in front of you on July 21st with a short-term uh, funding recommendation. Uh, we have another YFS working group meeting, I believe this Friday. Um, and then we'll be turning our attention to budget development for YFS and, and the longer term look. Uh, the new project on our list is the thrift um, store remodel. Uh, we're actually getting closer to having a consultant. Uh, we met today, we've got uh, three top um, architect firms and uh, we'll be doing a quick round of interviews and moving forward. Uh, Ed has been serving as the interim director over YFS. Sorry, I stole your thunder again, Ed. Anything else you would add? No, oh, just uh, emergency assistance has been up by about 50%. Now it's holding steady, but it shot up to a 50% increase over normal use because of the environment we're in. Um, the scout counselors are doing telemental health. School counselors are in a sort of a holding pattern to see what the fall looks like but are prepared to do some version of either in-person or um, telemental health type of a remote counseling services. And as a uh, city manager mentioned, there is uh, some significant optimism ahead, perhaps looking at uh, how to restore services. And I do imagine coming back to you on the 21st with some recommendations around that. So um, some exciting things ahead uh, from some uh, monies from the foundation. So stay tuned. Thank you. We have a question from council member Rosenbaum. Yeah, thanks Steve. The, um, can you, for the emergency services, where is the budget for that? Are we running low? Or what, what's that looking like at the end of the year? Obviously use is up, so where are we? Use is up and so are donations. So there's been some pretty incredible generosity uh, from this community. So. I certainly don't want to say we don't need any more money. That's not the message. Uh, nor is the message that we're running out of money. So we're doing okay and uh, due in large part to the generosity uh, of the community, which we can certainly always use more of. I really appreciate that question because this is a really critical service, um, especially for those who truly need it. And it's a, it's a, be a lifeline. So uh, donations are appreciated please keep them coming in. And at the same time, you know, we're not running out of money next week. So um, it, it's it's a good news story and we need to keep it going. Thank you. For that. Right. Well, thank, thank you to everyone in the community that's done it. Uh, Jesse, can you answer? I mean, honestly, you know, we had a, a few comments during public appearances regarding the thrift shop uh, project. And it's, a lot of the concerns and the questions pertain to possible impact on Mercedale Park. Are you in, in a position to kind of just address that or at least respond to that? Sure, and um, I've been working with a couple of council members on this project and, and I will say one of, the, one of the items that was top of mind as we looked at that project was not to impact the park and to stay within the existing footprint of, of the building and the facilities. Uh, so what's proposed right now is to do just that uh, the recycling center, we, we might need to adjust the driveway just a little bit. Um, I don't want to get ahead of the actual design process though. Um, uh, and that would just be to make sure we have sufficient um, uh, room to operate. So that's, that's the intent. Uh, the recycling center is really um, dormant right now. It, it's used uh, periodically, so there will be more use there. Um, Jason, I see you just popped in. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, I just want to be clear too. The 
the direction from council at the last council meeting was to get an architect engineering firm on board and get the project to 30% design and then come back to the council with a recommendation uh, on how to proceed and how to move forward. And so I just wanna make sure that the characterization of what's being done right now is is accurate. That is, we are not, we are not just going full project mode right now. It is uh, strategic, we're getting an architect firm on board so that we can do just as Jesse described, see what we can utilize the existing spaces for um, and, and then come back to the council with that information before we move forward beyond 30%. And will the public have an opportunity? I mean, obviously they'll see the 30% design. Uh, will there be a period of time for them to um, comment or raise questions? Uh, Mayor Wong, we plan to follow up with you on the 30% design on August 4th. Um, if you'd like to include a public you know, engagement process of some, um, some duration or some format, you would just need to factor that into the overall project timeline. Um, we would certainly welcome uh, public comments uh, as part of our August 4th discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Jacobson and then Councilmember Nice. Uh, Osborne Construction will uh, provide no cost to the city uh, estimating services uh, as any design evolves. And um, the, the benefits of that to the city are that typically architects use a uh, estimating service, which is a little bit short of the real world when it comes to costing this stuff. And also the timing of it. Uh, it'll be available if the architect says, well, what if we did a eight by 10 brace over here? What is that? Is that, is that, is that the cheapest, best solution? Or, you know, what do you do? So we're happy to collaborate on a, you know, phone call kind of basis and this kind of thing to uh, fuel, to help the architect and, and push the timeline of answers. Because if, if the, you know, if for some strange reason, the design gets out of control and this thing is a, you know, the uh, Ira Appleman uh, $1 million project, that's a whole different story. And we, we, there's no sense in going down the road if we're not, don't have our thumb on stuff as we go. So we're, we're prepared to do that and I'm prepared to spend uh, time with the architect if that's of benefit, so. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Nice. Jesse, there was other public testimony that seemed to seem to indicate that it might be irresponsible to keep the thrift shop closed. And maybe you could speak to, could you open it right now? Would you open it right now? Uh, and maybe reframe where where are we right now in terms of the pandemic and, and the amount of new COVID-19 cases? Sure. <laughs> um, this, is, this has been a really tricky operational one. If, if you know anybody that owns a retail business, you know, um, how significantly they impacted they are right now by COVID-19 operating restrictions. Um, for the thrift industry, we, we take it on both sides. The manner in which we accept donations is restricted and modified. And also um, how we sell goods is limited. Um, we had done some initial work. We have a blessing from WCIA, our insurance provider to move forward and reopen if it made sense to do so. Um, I'm not sure we can do so and have it be worth it right now today. Um, the other thing I'm concerned about, Councilmember Member Nice, I've mentioned this a couple of times, is that we laid off um, nearly our entire thrift shop staff, uh, except for two of our permanent employees who were furloughed to half time. Um, I need their resources right now uh, supporting us on this project analysis and the, the longer term look. Um, I don't see an easy way to lever up staffing only to turn around and have to lever it back down either for a project or for um, COVID-19 restrictions uh, that may be put back in place if our numbers continue to increase. So that being said, uh, we're still looking at it because we have inventory right now in the thrift shop that uh, council, after you see the 30% project, uh, should you confirm that we're moving forward, we have to move the inventory uh, we're talking about some alternatives to clear that inventory, like a sidewalk sale um, tied to the farmer's market. So that's likely. Uh, there's some limited 
uh, online sales still happening, uh, thanks to some volunteers that are supporting us on that. Um, so that's where that's where we're at. Uh, I I also need to note this is really really important, and and I, Suzanne Falon, our our thrift shop um, staff person, reminds me of this. We typically sell overflow to Goodwill. Um, if you've tried to make a donation to Goodwill right now, you know they're absolutely um, underwater and they um, may not be able to take our overflow. Uh, and so that's a problem uh, right now. Uh, we think it will be resolved going forward, uh, but it does limit our ability to accept donations. Uh, what we do anticipate, I will say, is uh, maybe some targeted campaigns going forward, um, the items that we can sell at the highest value, uh, perhaps sustaining our online sales. Uh, we're still working on it. Great. Thank you. Um, that takes us to the end of our discussion regarding the work plans. Um, Jesse, I think at this point, um, we're going to open it up to see if any council member has any new items that they want to suggest be added to a work plan. I don't, uh, does anybody want to suggest a, a new item? Can I raise one question? Uh, we did talk about this a couple of weeks ago, and that was, and I, I'm not sure exactly where it fits. I don't know if it fits within your city manager's office, but it was this idea of having implicit uh, bias training for city council members and also for the board and commission members. Uh, we, yeah, that's a good question. I didn't add it to the work plan yet because the direction was for us to come back with a proposal. Uh, it is on your schedule for follow-up on August 4th. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, uh, so, so council yeah. members, just uh, if, if you have any suggestions, I, I will say this, um, you've, you've heard my plea. Um, you know, the water line is like, here uh, for the staff. So um, I'm not enthusiastic about taking on anything new in 2020. Um, I do have a round of one-on-one -on -one check in meetings scheduled with all of you uh, in the coming weeks. And I would really like to hear your thoughts on this work plan and other items that aren't here so we can start putting together um, uh, budget proposals and, and ideas and uh, there's a lot of policy work that I know is on your mind because you've shared it with me, and that, that doesn't always involve a consultant. It just means I need to make sure I've got the staff resources um, to be able to accomplish the work. So I look forward to those conversations and uh, the fall budget discussion. Uh, thank you. Uh, Council Member uh, Rosenbaum. Uh, Jesse, answer my question. Okay. Uh, Deputy Mayor Weicker. So Jesse, I just have a quick question. How aggressive is this work plan given the uncertainty of COVID and given all these water main breaks that keep happening and who knows how complicated this thrift store remodel will be and the moratorium might be and you know whatever else might come up uh, that someone wants to sort of get done quickly but doesn't actually get done quickly. So what what's gonna fall off of this work plan that you'll have high hopes for? How do you reprioritize if you have to cut back even further? Uh, this whole year has been right, reactive and reprioritizing because uh, things were coming at us right and left that we, we never anticipated. Um, I will be uh, completely honest. We went through and we were pretty honest with you about the work that's not gonna get done and what's suspended. Um, could things change again? Yes, they could. And I will commit to maybe being a little more timely <laughs> it took me uh, four months to getting this back in front of you, but that's that's just been the circumstances. Or conservative. Um, yeah. Feels yeah. like you've bitten off a lot still. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, if I didn't say it already, the budget is my top priority at this point. Uh, it is a very important moment in time for us to regroup and restructure and reassess our levels of service and our priorities, um, and that's how I want to focus my time. Uh, and I need the staff focusing that way as well. So we will continue to communicate. Some of these work plan items are still showing, you know, they weren't 2020 items, they were out in 2021 anyway. We didn't really touch those. Um, so we'll, we need to reassess. Thank you. Um, Jesse, I assume you have enough 
direction uh, at this point uh, with respect to the work plan uh, items. Yeah, uh, so you've got a couple of motions. Uh, exactly. And so, um, again, um, we're going to break this up into two motions. And so I'm looking for a motion to amend the 2020 City Council priorities to include priority number four to provide emergency response services related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Is there... I still move. Okay, I'm not sure who. Second. Council Member Anderall, did you move? I moved. So it was moved by Council Member Anderall, and I heard a second from Council Member Jacobs. <coughs> um, so, uh, City Clerk, uh, do you want to do a roll call? Thank you, Mayor. If I understood correctly, you're going to split this into two motions. Correct. And we have a motion by Council Member Anderall and a second by Council Member Jacobson. Correct. That's Rosenbaum, actually, I think. Oh, was Rosenbaum? It Rosenbaum? I put my hand up. I don't know if that counts. Seconded by Council Member Rosenbaum. Thank you. I'll okay. correct that. Council Member Anderall? I will. Aye. Council Member Jacobson? Aye. Council Member Neese? Aye. Council Member Reynolds? Aye. Council Member Rosenbaum? Aye. Deputy Mayor Weicker? Aye. And Mayor Wong? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion passes. Uh, Council, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the modified 2020-2021 work plans. Yeah, thank you. I so move and I have, I, I would like to approve add something to my motion. And that is, I think I'd like to uh, put us all, all on record of commending the city manager and the staff for the heavy, heavy lifting they've done and, and staying on top of and, and keeping us informed with all this stuff that's going on. So you can clean that up, Deb. <laughs> I'll, I'll second that. Okay. Um, does that need to be part of the motion, uh, Councilmember Jacobson, or can I, I can just make it make it a, a part of the record versus part of the motion, okay. if that works? Okay. Does that work, Councilmember Jacobson? Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. We have a motion made by Councilmember Jacobson and seconded by Councilmember Rosenbaum to approve the modified 2020-2021 work plans. City Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Neese? Aye. Council Member Reynolds? Aye. Deputy Mayor Weicker? Aye. Mayor Wong? Aye. Council Member Rosenbaum? Aye. Council Member Anderall? Aye. And Council Member Jacobson? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Passes. Uh, we now move to other business and planning schedule. So, uh, City Manager Jesse Ball. Okay. So I think um, at one point earlier this year, I said over my dead body, would we have any meetings in August? Um, and here we are having a meeting in August. <laughs> so, uh, I just wanted to make sure you noted that I did add the August fort meeting to the schedule. Uh, Council Member Jacobson is going to be traveling. Uh, we're going to see what we can do to get his technology connected so he can participate because he would not want to miss that meeting. Um, uh, we have built out all of the items that we need to get done before the August break. I am still recommending that we take uh, the August 18th meeting off. Uh, mostly you've earned a break. You've been working really hard and so have the staff. Um, but we also need that in time to be um, working on the budget. So I do want to ask a scheduling question. Uh, we did not have a mid-year planning session. Uh, we were starting this, uh, you may recall, we were trying to schedule it and uh, it didn't get done. That would have been the opportunity where we would have done the pre-budget work, you know, talked about your vision for the budget. Uh, I'm gonna, Matt and I are working on other ways to get that feedback from you. Uh, so as we head into September, on September 1st, we have a, uh, the way the calendar falls, we have, we have two early meetings in September, the 1st and the 15th. 
Uh, the 15th is going to be just a little too early for us to get you the preliminary budget. We really need to do that the following week. Um, I can either follow up with all of you to, to confirm your availability for a special meeting. Um, I could look at just canceling the 15th and moving it out to the 24th. Um, actually, I don't think it's the 24th. It's the 22nd. The second. Yeah. Um, an another idea came up is if you really wanted to do a longer budget workshop, uh, we could do it at the end of September. Some cities uh, do like a planning session on the front side of their budget work. So if you had an interest in doing it that way, we could do a, a Friday, Saturday, a Saturday. Uh, we could do back-to-back -back evenings just dedicated to walking through the preliminary budget. I, I just wanted to get your feedback because I am mindful that we missed um, uh, the mid-year planning session discussion. Any thoughts? Everyone's tired? <laughs> Uh, I would be. Yeah. I'd be in favor of um, potentially canceling the fifteenth and moving it to the twenty second, so that we can do that. Um, I don't know that I have a strong feeling about a whole separate budget planning session, but I'll be available whatever we decide to do. Okay. Council Member Reynolds. Yeah, I don't have a specific request on how we do it, but I just want to say. The budget is hugely important to the city always, but especially this year. Let's make sure we have time to talk about it. I'm happily happy to devote a Saturday or whatever it takes to do it. I'll trust you to recommend a way. Okay. Council Member Jacobson? Whatever it takes. Okay. Yeah, I would just chime in that uh, given some of your earlier comments, uh, Jesse, uh, the fact that this is probably going to be one of the most important budgets that the city council adopts. Uh, I agree with all the other uh, council members who have spoken that we, we need to spend the time to do it. So um, I would sort of leave it up to you in terms of making sure that you are prepared and that your staff has had time to go through this so that when we, when we do meet for the preliminary uh, budget discussions, we have as much information and um, you know we should spend the time as a council going through it. Let me, uh, without feedback and hearing that there's some flexibil flexibility, I will be meeting with the leadership team tomorrow. Let me talk with them about strategy. I think one of the big pieces here is we need to walk through the organizational structure, and that is going to be a layer that is much larger than in prior years. Um, so that, that we need to carve some time out for that. I'll get back to you with a suggestion. Okay. Uh, um, Rosenbaum. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing Benson said. You know, I think, it, you know, Jesse, when it comes to the staff work in terms of, you know, when, when does the staff think that a conversation would be most productive? Because um, I just sort of know in this group, we, we tend to get bogged down in numbers a lot. Um, so just make sure that we have, we have access to those numbers. Uh, my, my only issues with Tenor is that the Jewish holidays uh, are on the weekend this year, um, and I will not be available. Right Thanks. Next. We'll take, thank you for that reminder. Thank you. Uh, Jesse, anything else on the planning uh, schedule? I know that we need probably, uh, if we were thinking of canceling the August 18th meeting, uh, we need a motion to do that. So I'm assuming that people are, are okay with a possible cancellation. So if that's the case, I can entertain a motion to approve the cancellation of the second regular meeting of August 18, 2020. So moved. Thank you. Did I hear a second? I think Craig seconded it. I oh, did? Okay. Actually, I would have to take me to it. Oh, okay. okay, it's been moved by Deputy Mayor Weicker and seconded by, I'm not sure who at this point, but uh, I'll give it to Council Member. And Council Member Jacobson. Oh, Council Member Jacobson. To Council the second regular meeting of August 18, 2020. Uh, City Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Anderl? Aye. Council Member Jacobson? Aye. Council Member Neese? Aye. Council Member Rosenbaum? Aye. Mayor Wong? Aye. Council Member Reynolds? Aye. And Deputy Mayor Weicker? Aye. Motion passes. 
Um, thank you. It's been a long meeting. Uh, we're almost finished uh, with this regular meeting. Um, are there any upcoming council member absences to report? We know that council member Jacobson may not be with us on August 4. Does anybody else have anything to report as far as absences? Okay. Um, council member reports. Uh, we'll start with council member Jacobson. I'm you, Jake. Any reports? <laughs> yeah, I, it's less a report than a question. And that is, we have planning, a design commission and a planning commission meetings. And are those going to be available to the general public on Zoom? Yes, uh, actually. Yeah. Um, Evan, if you're still hanging around, do you want to comment? Uh, so the we don't have any planning mission, pardon me, planning commission meetings scheduled in July or August. I do anticipate you'll have one in September. Okay. Uh, we do have a design commission meeting actually tomorrow night. It's a study session. It is not going to be televised. Uh, so we're not broadcasting it onto YouTube. Uh, we do have the opportunity for people to join the Zoom meeting as an attendee to observe the meeting while it's in progress and we will have an audio recording of the meeting afterwards. So it's it's not quite the same as the way your council uh, council meetings are being conducted, but it's but it's somewhat similar. Could you send me the link to that, please? I can. It's also available on our Let's Talk page. There is a link there for the uh, for anyone who desires to to connect yeah, an attendee. Great Nothing question. else. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Uh Nothing to report. Thank you. Council Member Neese? No, no reports. Council Member Reynolds? Uh, nothing to report, but I would just like to take a minute to say thank you to Evan Max. I might have a chance to work with him over a couple of years on the planning commission, and uh, he displayed incredible grace under fire and in a very difficult position, extremely technically knowledgeable, and I'd say he perfectly walked the fine line of balance between staff support and, and advocacy and, and left the policy decisions to the planning commission. They gave us all the tools and all the information we needed, and I, I very much appreciate his support over the years. Wish him all the best. Thank you. Councilmember Rosenbaum. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to, to thank Evan as well. Um, Evan's got a, such a depth of knowledge about our city uh, and how everything works here, and I know we're going to miss that, uh, but wish him Evan best of luck uh, at his next position. Um, I just want to give a, another plug for wearing masks. Um, you know, it's been great to see so many people, especially at the farmer's market and kind of on Sundays in that area wearing masks. But um, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't, uh, given the cases are growing, to, to give a plug for that. So I was thinking maybe we could all wear our masks for this meeting. Yep, Lisa's ready. <laughs> I thought that could be a funny uh, social media plug, but maybe next time. It's always a good reminder. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Weicker. Uh, I just want to echo everyone's sentiments and thank you to Evan Maxim. He's been a delight to learn from and work with these many years. Appreciate that. And a shout out to Betsy Zuber for her 20 years of service with the city too. I know she's a beloved resource we're going to miss. Um, so while we're at it, thank you for the two other directors picking up the slack, uh, Chief Holmes and uh, Public Works Director. So thank you very much for all that. And then I want to let you guys know that the Sound Cities Association is doing a racial equity and justice training on Friday at 2.30. There's a web link in your emails if you're interested in learning more about that topic and getting engaged on what we might be able to do here local in our city. Thank you. I just have uh, two or three things I just wanted to mention. Uh, before I forget, uh, our next city council meeting will be a special meeting on Tuesday, July 14th, with an executive session at 5 p.m. and a study session at uh, 5.45 p.m. Um, on Thursday, June 18, the city manager and I met with, virtually met with uh, state representatives Tonneson and Milan Tai, where we shared the city's priorities for the expected special session that uh, should be convened sometime in August. Uh, again, you, you folks had already approved uh, the legislative agenda items or priorities, and again, we just shared them with our representatives. Um, on Tuesday, June 23, Council Members Reynolds, Jacobson, and I met along with Police Chief uh, Holmes and Jason Kittner and Allie Speets 
with uh, some uh, Mercer Island High School students and uh, community folks uh, regarding a number of issues that were sparked by the recent death of George Floyd. Um, and so it was a good discussion. Uh, we, we talked uh, somewhat about uh, the police's uh, use of force policy and uh, also had a discussion about uh, President Obama's mayor's uh, pledge. So those discussions are still ongoing and it uh, sounds like it'll be something that would take up maybe in August 4. Um, so with that, uh, I think we are, uh, the next item is gonna be an executive session. Uh, the city council will recess briefly and then go into an executive session for approximately 60 minutes to discuss with legal counsel pending or potential litigation pursuant to RCW 42.30.110 paren one close paren paren small i close paren for approximately again for 60 minutes no action will be taken uh, at the executive session there being no further business to come before the council the time is now 8 42 p.m and the meeting is adjourned uh, again council members please stay seated until that has officially terminated our broadcast and we'll reconvene in special i'm sorry an executive session in about 10 minutes Sure.